Hello friends. This is Fanfic Adventure. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto had power to control rivers Hades of the underworld? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. Three hours later, Naruto snuck towards the Hokage Tower. Last time, he had tried to walk in like everyone else did. That didn't go so well, and Naruto found himself hanging upside down from a nearby tree while various villagers and some shinobi beat him. Luckily, the old man had heard the noise and intervened personally, he hadn't seen any of them since. When he got within sight of the tower, he looked and gave a sigh of relief. The two guards outside the tower were some of the nicer shinobi, at least from his viewpoint. Two of the Anbu, Inu and Nako, were in plain sight, situated so that they could quickly stop anything that could happen since they were on duty, he'd be able to get into the tower unharmed. Forcing himself to ignore the glares he got when he stepped out into the street, he made his way to the tower, smiling at the guards as he walked in. When he got to the waiting room in front of the Hokage's office, the secretary told him to go right on in. Sarutobi was thanking the kami that while he had been out, his paperwork had only grown by about 25, instead of the usual 50 to 60. He looked up when he heard the door open, and broke out into a smile when he saw Naruto enter. Ah, good. You made it in safely. Sure did, Oji-san. The villagers didn't do anything more than glare since Inu-san and Nako-chan were out there. Well, take a seat and let's get started. Once Naruto had taken a seat, Sarutobi took a deep breath and began to organize his thoughts. Naruto, what I have to tell you is going to be very difficult for you, I would imagine, it concerns your parents. My parents? You know who my parents were? Why didn't you ever tell me? Yandaimi himself, before he died, ordered me not to tell you any of this until I thought you were ready. Even now, I can't tell you everything. Some of it will have to wait until either you turn 16, or make chunin, whichever comes first. That stopped Naruto cold. The Yandaimi had ordered the old man not to say anything about his parents, what could have possibly made him do that, and there was still more that he couldn't find out until later? R. Dot are my parents still alive? That was probably the quietest he had ever been in his life. Sigh. No your mother died soon after you were born. The Kayubi attack sent her into premature labor, and the stress was just too much, she lived just long enough to name you, and died. Your father died fighting the Kayubi. Naruto's eyes dimmed a little after hearing that, especially how his mother died. I see. Then what am I doing here? You're here to find out about your mother and her family, the Uzumaki clan. Naruto's head shot up. Wait, the Uzumaki clan? And what about my dad's family? Your father's side of the family is what you need to wait for, it was part of what I was told to do concerning you. I was told by the Yandaimi that when I judged you ready, to tell you about your mother, when you met either of the requirements for your father's will, you would find out then. Wow. So what can you tell me about my mom? Her name was Uzumaki Kashina, heiress of the Uzumaki clan, from Uzu no Kuni. That got a raised eyebrow from Naruto. Wait, heiress? And was my family named after the country, or was the country named for my family? Uzu no Kuni was named for the numerous whirlpools which doted her coast, the Uzumaki clan. Before their demise during the collapse of the country, were one of the strongest clans there, as they were one of the few shinobi clans to be found there. Whoa! So I'm the last Uzumaki? You are the last known Uzumaki in existence? It's always possible that some of the other clan members survived. For that matter, you are also the last known member of your father's clan. I thought you couldn't tell me about him yet. You're right, Naruto-kun, I can't tell you much about him. I can't give you his name or whatever inheritance he may have left you, not yet. I can, however, share other, more general, information. Oh, so what else do I need to know? Since you aren't that far into the academy, I'll try to simplify this. The Uzumaki clan, in general, had either water or wind as their primary affinity, with the other one as their secondary affinity. This means that they could use Sweden and food and jutsu more easily than the other three types. One of the other pieces of information on your father's clan I can tell you is that they also shared these two affinities, although on occasion, some showed an affinity for Raiden as well. 
So do I have a Kekai Jenke or something like that? Well, I'm not sure about that, honestly. Neither of your parents' clans had one, but there is a possibility that the mixture of the two could result in one. We haven't noticed one in you yet, but that could always change later. I'll let you know if anything happens, then. So, what made you decide I was ready for all of this, Oji-san? Our conversation earlier, at the academy. Both your parents and their clans believed that relying solely on Kekai Jenke or clan techniques was foolish. They also felt that such things did not merit special treatment. Naruto blinked at this. But in Konoha, that's exactly how things are. If you come from a clan with a Kekai Jenke, you're almost guaranteed to be treated like royalty here. The Teme is proof of that. How could my parents stand it? Sarutobi calmly nodded. They struggled with it. They hoped that they would be able to change that. They argued with most of the village on the subject. Both clans had believed for a very long time that over-reliance would eventually weaken the shinobi, and become more of a liability than an advantage. So, both clans made it a point to learn as much as they could in any area. They not only learned many different ninjutsu of all types, but tai, gen, ken, and even fuinjutsu. They also expanded that philosophy into non-shinobi areas, too, learning many different crafts and skills. You come from two families of very self-reliant people, Naruto-kun. When I heard you talk about that lecture, I knew you were ready. At this point, Naruto was in shock, his jaw hanging open. In a little over an hour, he had learned a rather staggering amount about people he would never meet. He may not have any emotional connection to either side of his family, but he found that he was strangely determined to do his best to live up to their high standards. After taking a little time to gather his wits, he asked, "So." What's next? Next come your mother's clan techniques. Seeing the look on Naruto's face, Serutobi answered the question before it was even asked. I said your parents did not approve of relying on clan techniques, not that they didn't have any. I have had the honor of seeing six of your mother's most powerful clan jutsu in action, one of which qualifies as an ARNK kinjutsu, and have knowledge of a seventh, an S rank kinjutsu. Nothing could have removed Naruto from the office now, while well, what are they? Silently, Serutobi got up from his chair, walked to the back of his office, and opened up a hidden safe behind a false wall with pictures of the holders of the Hokage title. He removed two scrolls, and returned to his desk. He handed one of the scrolls to Naruto, which was sealed with a spiral emblem. That Naruto, is everything of the Uzumaki clan archives that can be found within the walls of Konoha. I was made aware that there is a complete library, located underneath what was once the Uzumaki clan compound in Uzu no Kuni. When you are ready for it, you will travel there and retrieve it, if you wish. To this day, the library is undisturbed, as it can only be found, let alone opened by a blood member of the Uzumaki. Serutobi waited a few moments for the boy to process that, then continued. Now, as for the jutsu I spoke of, it is said that long ago, there were five rivers to be found in hell. Acheron, the river of sorrow. Kokaitis, the icy river of lamentation, Phlegathon, the river of fire, Lethe, the river of forgetfulness, and Styx, river of hate. There were also rumors of a sixth river, Nemozine, river of memory. The Uzumaki clan was gifted with the ability to call upon these waters in battle, to great and terrible effect. Naruto had to manually close his jaw. His mother's family could do that, and they chose not to overuse it. Finally, he managed to say, that's only six, and which two were the kinjutsu? Each river, when called upon in battle, would produce the effect associated with it. The waters of the Acheron would cause an opponent to be consumed in sorrow. Phlegethan waters would burn continuously, even in the absence of fuels, and so on. The Lethe water, which is the A rank, would cause the target to forget anything the user wished. Imagine being able to cause your opponent to forget every technique he or she knows, or making their body forget how to activate a Kekai Jenke, even if their mind still remembers how. Hell, you could even make their body forget how to properly channel chakra, ruining their control. Bug-eyed and chalk-white, Naruto found his voice. Holy crap, I'm almost afraid to ask about the S rank. Nemozine is the S rank, and the one I have never seen. The water would cause someone who drank or was soaked with it to become all-knowing, a mortal god, as it were. Naruto's jaw found its way to the floor, then through it. Yowza. That's definitely an S-rank jutsu. I'm not finished. 
The human mind is not capable of handling that kind of power. As a result, the afflicted person is driven incurably insane. H. How is this possible? To call upon the rivers of hell, it would be like, like summoning the Shinigami to battle your foes. Naruto missed Serutobi flinching at how close he came to describing the final events of the Kyubi attack. I know, it seems too good to be true, yet it is. Finally, the seventh technique is a summoning technique that can only be done near a large, open body of water, like a sea or an ocean. It is known as Kuchios, Charybdis. It summons a creature who then creates a giant, inescapable, whirlpool to consume your enemies. At this point, Naruto was taking shallow, ragged breaths, gripping the Uzumaki scroll hard enough to turn his knuckles white. I I I don't know what to say, Oji-san. This is unbelievable, my mother's clan could do stuff like this, and chose not to. Also, how in Kami's name could they have gained the ability to do this? Serutobi closed his eyes, nodded, and made a humming sound. Then, he replied, Naruto-kun, to answer your last question, I have no idea. I never had the chance to ask your mother about it. I would suspect that you might find the answer in the Uzumaki library when you're older. Al all right. Now what's with the other scroll? Naruto asked, looking at the second scroll for the first time. This is your father's clan scroll, your final inheritance when you are ready. I can't give it to you yet, but I want you to know what it looks like and where it is kept. That was Serutobi's reply as he showed Naruto the emblem holding this scroll shut wind blowing across the sea, creating waves. He then replaced the scroll in the safe, locking it, and hiding it once again. Why is that? I am a ninja, not to mention Hokage, and am required to be realistic. No matter how hard I may try, there is always the chance that I will not be the one to give you this. I may, sometime in the next few years, find someone to become the godime, and retire again. You would then need to get the scroll from them. I am also an old man, and have lived well beyond the average life expectancy for a ninja. I may die before you meet the requirements to obtain your father's will. That sobered Naruto. Oh, so, what now? I want you to channel some chakra into this. Serutobi handed Naruto a white card, one side covered with seals. I've seen some shinobi use things like this. But they didn't have seals on them. Those are used to test one's primary affinity. This will analyze the strength of your affinity to all five elements. Okay. Channeling chakra into the paper, Naruto saw five different colored bars appear on a graph. Handing the card back to the Sandane, he waited for the verdict. Well, wind is your primary affinity. Water is second, like I said it would be. You have a mild affinity for earth, not as strong as wind and water, but better than average. Fire and lightning, however, are almost beyond your grasp. It will take a lot more effort to properly learn, use, or master those elemental techniques. So if I want to use a lot of fire and lightning jutsu, they're going to be very difficult. Yes, it will take about two or three times more effort than someone who has it as a primary affinity. Huh. Well, I really don't know how much more I can handle. A smirk found its way to the old man's at this. Then this should be good for a laugh or two. One last thing. Before you go, then, when you eventually get married, it would be best for her to be a wind or water affinity as well, if she's a kunoichi. He wasn't disappointed. That proved to be enough to snap Naruto's mind, and he blacked out, falling out of the chair. Ah, that was worth it. Chuckling, Serutobi got Naruto over to a couch on the side of his office, one normally reserved for when he needed a break, but couldn't leave the office. Half an hour later, he heard the moans and groans signaling Naruto's return to consciousness. Ugh, what in the elemental countries happened? Heh, heh, you took in a little too much in one sitting. Yeah, I'll be going, then. I want to start reading this as soon as I can. Actually, that's a storage scroll. Inside are seals containing pretty much everything your mother wanted you to have now. I'd imagine inside you'd find information on clan policies, taijutsu styles, other clan jutsu, and things like that. You might even find pictures or a journal. Oh, cool. I'll have to visit if there's something I don't understand. For some reason, the academy teachers don't answer my questions. Sigh. I don't believe this. I'm too old for this. Feel free to visit when you can.
you'll probably get some experience in my job if you do. Cool. One thing I want to figure out is how to take care of all this paperwork. You always seem to be doing that whenever you're here, and I don't want to be stuck in here all the time. Naruto-kun, if you can find a way to defeat this paperwork, I will personally train you to take over for me. That got a big grin out of the boy. Be careful, I might just take you up on that offer. If you can show me a way to finish this up in less time, you will have earned it. I'll see what I can think of, then. Bye Oji-san. With that Naruto headed off for Ichiraku's, then home. Okay. So pairing wise, I'm thinking one of two girls. Hanada and Tamari. I could stretch it to fit Tenten, but the way I see the story going would work best with Hanada or Tamari. I don't have a problem with other pairings, but they wouldn't work for this FIC. As far as making this into a harem FIC, it's a possibility, but I wouldn't go beyond the three girls I've named. I find it annoying when harem fix have every female character ever named go after one guy, unless that was the intent of the original work. Two or three girls, however, I have no problem with. It had been two weeks since the Hokage had given Naruto his mother's inheritance. Naruto had put the time to good use. He had read through the clan information several times, making trips to visit Sarutobi when he needed something explained. Between the scroll and the sandane, he had figured out how his mother wound up in Konoha. Five years before Naruto's birth, the Uzumaki clan, before the demise of Uzu no Kuni, decided that there was a very good chance that the clan would be destroyed. As a result, they decided to put a failsafe plan into action. Favors were called in, and it was arranged for one member of the Uzumaki clan to travel to and reside in each of the five great ninja villages. That way, regardless of what happened to the majority of the clan, someone, in theory, would be able to preserve and restore the clan. Serutobi filled in the gaps as to what had happened to the other four. The clansman sent to Karigakur was unfortunately caught up in a riot resulting from the Bloodline Massacre. Since the Uzumaki had no Kekai Genke, he wasn't a target. He was a bystander who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. The Uzumaki sent to Kumogakur had run afoul of the Rakage's supporters. Even back then, the Rakage had lusted after the Byakugan of the Hyuga clan, believing it would bring them power. The clan member had, true to the Uzumaki beliefs, made several arguments over how the Byakugan and the Jukan alone would not ensure a rise in power. Later, she was found dead, having been tortured and mutilated horribly. By this point, the rest of the clan had fallen, so there were no worries over breaking the contract ensuring her safety. The third person, who, according to Serutobi, was Naruto's cousin, had been sent to Iwagakur. He never arrived. The escort party was ambushed about halfway though the journey by an unknown group, and the recovery team that was dispatched could not find his body. Serutobi told Naruto that if there were any other surviving Uzumaki, it would be this cousin. Finally, the woman sent to Sunagakur died shortly after her arrival there. The caravan taking her to Suna was attacked by bandits. She helped fight them off, but a bandit struck a lethal blow. She died two days later in the Suna hospital. Naruto was now preparing to try and learn some of his clan techniques. He was annoyed to find out that more than half of the jutsu listed as Uzumaki only could only be performed near a large body of water, like a sea or ocean, or lacking that, a deep, fast-moving river. One such jutsu was the Naruto no jutsu, which simply couldn't be performed in landlocked Konoha. That one he had really wanted to learn, if only because it had his name on it. He had also gotten Serutobi's help preparing him for the day he would be ready to learn the six river techniques. The scroll with the information on them had included a set of seals that needed to be applied somewhere on the body in order to use the techniques. The seals themselves were nothing more than the sets of kanji for the attributes of each of the six rivers hatred, sorrow, etc., and when properly applied, looked like tattoos. When asked where he wanted them, Naruto had them placed between his shoulders. Right now, he was getting set to try one of the chakra control exercises specially developed by the Uzumaki clan. While the academy teachers had shown the students one involving a leaf, he wasn't doing so well with it, and the teachers would berate him for his lack of progress, when they weren't ignoring him outright. Then he had read in the scroll that, 
By default, an Uzumaki had poor chakra control using the standard control exercises, until they had at least attempted the Uzumaki ones. Hoping that this would remedy his troubles, he had spoken to the old man, and now Inu-san was accompanying him to an empty training ground. According to the scroll, the exercise required a naturally formed whirlpool. Since Konoha was landlocked, Naruto had to improvise, and the scroll had provided a way to perform the exercise inland. All that was required was a pool of water at least 5 feet deep and 10 feet wide. The training ground Naruto was heading for had a small waterfall with a basin that met the requirements. Once there, he would have to use a technique to create a whirlpool in the basin, and use chakra to hold himself on top of the whirlpool, and not get sucked under. In order to master the exercise, he would need to be able to successfully walk against the current inside a whirlpool spinning at full power. Now to any observer, this would have looked and sounded ridiculous. An academy student, attempting a harder variation of the water walking exercise. Naruto, however, was aware of the trick to helping him learn it safely. The jutsu that would create the whirlpool relied on the amount of chakra applied to affect the size and speed of the whirlpool. Since he lacked the ability to properly control the chakra used or to use the jutsu and hold himself up at the same time, Inu-san would be in control of the technique. Should Naruto fall in, Inu-san could quickly cancel the jutsu and pull him out. Since this was a nameless technique, designed specifically for training, Naruto had no reservations about showing Inu-san how to perform it. Once they arrived, Naruto set down a backpack containing some towels and a change of clothes. For this exercise, he was wearing black swimming trunks and a white undershirt, since he didn't want to walk home in a soaking wet orange jumpsuit if he could help it. Ready, Naruto-kun, came the slightly distorted voice from behind the porcelain dog mask. After Naruto nodded, the Anbu began channeling chakra into the water, causing it to spin. In less than a minute, a whirlpool matching the description of the beginner's level of the exercise had formed. Naruto took a moment to focus and began channeling chakra to his feet like he was told. As one would expect, he didn't stay on top at all, but for this, it didn't matter. For beginners, all that mattered was not touching the bottom and using chakra to hold yourself in place as long as possible. Then, as control improved, you would push yourself up further out of the water until you could stand on the water. The water was cold, but not too bad. Inu-san's chakra had the extra effect of warming the water slightly. It had been warmed enough to where Naruto wouldn't be risking hypothermia. Had there not been the waterfall continuously adding cold water, and the stream taking away the warmed water, it could have been better. After an hour, Naruto was told to come out, so Inu-san could give his chakra coils a much-needed rest. The Anbu muttered, geez, creating and sustaining the whirlpool must double as a chakra building technique. It's harder than it looks. That may be true, but the control part of it sure works. Check it out. Naruto had decided to see if there was any noticeable improvement with the leaf exercise, and there was. Before, the leaf had hovered about a foot above where it was supposed to, and Naruto's efforts in the past hour had shaved two or three inches off of the height. Interesting. Normally, you would be a junin before you could hold the leaf that far off your body. Really? So I'm almost junin level. That's awesome. Naruto started jumping up and down at that. Whoa, hold on there. The only things remotely close to junin level about you are your stamina and chakra reserves. The combination of junin level chakra reserves and sub-academy student level control is just asking for trouble. So, do you think maybe that's why I have so much trouble with the bunshin? My henge and kawerimi are pretty bad too, but I can at least make them work halfway decently. It is possible. Normally, by the time a ninja makes Junin, or even Chunin, they've already learned an advanced Bunshin Jutsu, and either stop using the Academy one altogether, or only use it rarely. To be honest, the only shinobi I can think of that regularly use the basic Bunshin are the Academy teachers. Advanced Bunshin, can you teach me one? Please. Naruto begged, even attempting puppy dog eyes, but it only succeeded in making the Anbu laugh. Nice try but that doesn't work on me. Only women can pull that off really well. As for the jutsu, I don't think so. If you already a genin, I'd consider it, but not an academy student. Crud. Then, would you at least tell me about them? Hmm. Okay. 
I'll tell you about the two most common Bunshin techniques besides the Academy one. Then, we go back to training. Deal. You got it. Naruto was glad he had gotten that much of the Anbu. Normally, no one besides the old man would answer his questions. Alright. After the Academy level Bunshin, the most common technique is the Mizu Bunshin, which forms solid clones from nearby water sources. If there isn't a water source nearby, you need to pull water from the air around you, which is very difficult. Only the Nadaim was good enough to do it on a regular basis, earning him a reputation as a very powerful ninja. After that, there's the Suchi Bunshin. Again, it forms solid clones, this time out of the ground around you, so it can be used in more places. Now then, back into the water. Okay, okay. Thanks for the info though. Should I try holding myself in place longer, or start trying to push myself out of the water? Well, whatever you do, don't go one way or another. In order to master this, you need to be able to do both at the same time. You can't do that if you don't try to combine the two at some point before then. Right now, I'd focus more on staying in place more, and try to raise yourself up a little bit. Oh, okay. With that, Naruto resumed the exercise, trying to work on two different things at once. By the time the two decided to call it a day, Naruto could hold himself about two inches out of the water and hold fall in for about ten minutes. Not the best, but not too shabby for one day's effort. He also had the leaf exercise down to the point where it would have earned a pass for any student except him. So, four o'clock on Monday, Naruto-kun. Yeah, that should work. I'll be done with the academy for the day by then. I think I'll just spend the rest of today working on a clan taijutsu style I saw. The scroll says that a master of this style can beat both the Sharingan and the Byakugan. That got the ANBU's attention. Many ninja claim to have developed a that a style like that, but they've all failed. So how does yours work? Well, both dujutsu allow the user to see chakra. So, to counter them, you channel so much chakra that it either blinds them if you're fighting a Hyuga, or makes it so they can't see what you're doing, if it's a Uchiha. They would know only the most general of movements, like which direction you would come in at, or if you're going to punch or kick, but wouldn't be able to see if it is a closed fist, an open fist, or a hand weapon attacking. Also, doing this prevents them from copying jutsu. They can't copy the seals if they can't see the seals, right? The ANBU was at a loss. It makes sense in theory, but how does he know so much? I suppose, but how do you know so much about their Kekai Genke? That sort of information is highly classified. Before she died, my mom took notes on all the Kekai Genke in the village, and came up with a bunch of possible strategies on how to beat them. It's up to me to see if any of them work, though. This should be interesting. The Anbu muttered to himself, I should have known. The Uzumaki dislike of Kekai Genke was legendary in the Shinobi world. Of course she would have wanted to prove her point here, where Kekai Genke are worshipped. Um, Inu-san. The Anbu turned to look at Naruto. My clan didn't dislike Kekai Genke, at least not not as much as what you might think. They disliked it when clans became dependent on them to fight. Second, you knew my mother. I knew of her, but I never really got the chance to meet her. What I do know is that she had a reputation as being a true kunoichi, not some pathetic fangirl type. Now, I thought you were orphaned at birth. How could you know about the Uzumaki clan? I was. Mom died after I was born, and my dad died fighting the Kyubi. The Yandaimi had ordered the old man not to tell me about mom until I was ready. He told me about two or three weeks ago. Sensei. What could have prompted you to do that? What about your father and his family? Not much. Oji-san said that most of that would have to wait until I either turn 16 or make chunin. What I do know is that they had pretty much the same attitude as the Uzumaki on things like Kekai Genke. Huh. Why does this sound so familiar? Anything else? Yeah. The rest of my inheritance is in a scroll in Oji-san's office, sealed with an emblem dealing with wind and waves. Naruto heard the sound of someone choking, and looked at the Anbu, only to see him lying on his back coughing. By the kami, there's no way he could be sensei's son. I mean, aside from the hair, the eyes, and, oh shit. Damn it, how could I miss this? Without the whiskers, he looks just like sensei. 
Hataki. You idiot. Take your own advice and look underneath the underneath. Are you okay? Inu-san. Ah. Yeah. A fly flew into my mask and down my throat. How could a fly get though that mask? Alright. I'll see you on Monday, then. Bye. Naruto walked out of the training area, leaving the Anbu to sit up, one thought running through his head. Following his new training program had sent Naruto to bed exhausted. In the morning, he was refreshed, although he was still a little sore. He was now headed towards the academy to see if his new regimen had done enough compared to his classmates' training. Meanwhile, over at the Hokage Tower, Serutobi was about to have an unexpected visitor. Sandame Sama, Inu san is here to see you. Serutobi looked up from his paperwork to his receptionist. There wasn't too much paperwork to do at the moment, but the day had just started, and the village certainly had enough trees to generate more. Hum, I wasn't expecting this at all. Send him in. Bowing, the receptionist backed out of the office as an Anbu in a dog mask walked in. Good morning, Hokage-sama. Morning, Kakashi-san. No book today. This must be serious. I believe it is. It has to do with Naruto. I see. How did his training go yesterday? Very well. He is as good as can be expected from someone still in the academy. Also, the whirlpool technique apparently doubles as a chakra building exercise. Just from those few hours I was performing it, my reserves grew a noticeable amount. Yet that isn't what I was here for. Then what brings you here? I'll be blunt, Hokage-sama. Is Naruto my sensei's son? That got an eyebrow to rise from the sandane. An unusual question. Why do you ask? When we took a break, Naruto told me about his inheritance from his mother, and said that his father's will was in a scroll in your office, sealed with an emblem of wind and waves. Sensei was the only person in Konoha with that type of family crest. Also, once I got a good look at him, he looks too much like Sensei for it to be coincidence. Is there something I should know? I hoped he would have had more sense than to tell someone else about that scroll, but he is only 10. At any rate, you're right. He is the son and heir of Namikaze Minato, Yandaimi Hokage, as well as Uzumaki Kashina. He is the last known living member of both clans. Why wasn't anyone told? It might have helped him get adopted. Surely Sensei could have arranged that for his son, rather than trust the villagers. Minato didn't trust the villagers. Wait, what? He said he wanted Naruto to seen as a hero. Doesn't that mean he had faith, however misguided, in the village? Yes and no. Yandaimi believed in the village, but not the villagers. There is a difference. He was willing to lay down his life to protect the village. However, he was well aware of the fact that most of the villagers would probably ignore his dying wish. Yet, he gave them a chance to prove him wrong, by honoring his wish. So far, he's been proven right. He also made sure that Naruto couldn't be adopted, and set penalties in his will in case anything should happen to Naruto. He made sure Naruto couldn't be adopted. What penalties? You lost me, Hokage-sama. If Naruto were to be adopted, his new parents would have complete control over his inheritance from both his mother and father. What would stop them from killing Naruto after that, and keeping everything? That was how Yandaimi saw it, so he made it impossible for anyone, even me, to adopt him under most circumstances. I'm sorry to admit he seems to be right about that as well. And these penalties you spoke of. I'm not aware of all of them, but I know of some. There is a stipulation in the will leaving a very sizable amount of money to the village. It can only be accessed by Naruto himself when he turns 18. He also has final say in whether or not the money is ever given to the village. So the village could be stabbing itself in the foot for all we know. Why wasn't Naruto sent outside the village then? He could have lived the life you wanted for him elsewhere. The contract with the Uzumaki clan prevents that. When Kashina died, the contract passed on to Naruto, guaranteeing him residence within the village. Much as they might want to, the council can't exile Naruto or order his death, under any circumstances. Should either happen, we would lose much of our funding. Except for Naruto, isn't the Uzumaki clan dead? How could our funding be cut? There is one member who hasn't been located. Anyway, the contract was made using the fire daimyo as a middleman. Should anything happen to Naruto while he is within Hino Kuni, short of death by an attacking foreign nin, 
or if he should die in the Chunin exams, the daimyo is to cut our budget by about 30%, as is stated in the contract. Wow. They've really got us in a tight spot then. Yes, they do. The question remains, what are you going to do now with this information? I think I'm going to give Naruto a little bit of extra training. Nothing major, just some help correcting what the academy teachers might have done to sabotage him. Maybe teach him some easy jutsu. I don't think that's unreasonable. I see no problem with that, and will arrange for you to do so. I would, however, ask you to tell Naruto not to speak of his father's will. That must be kept a secret. Yes sir, Hokage-sama. Now then, we need to get over to the academy soon. Naruto couldn't believe his luck. The normal teacher was out sick, and the replacement teacher was the one teacher in the academy who seemed to like him, a chunin named Yumino Uruka. Also, he had actually managed to arrive on time, if not a little early, so things were really looking up. Now all he needed was a good seat. Normally, he would try to get a seat next to Sakura-chan, but she and the only other blonde in the class, a girl named Ino, had just gotten into a fight over who got to sit next to Sasuke-tem. Sakura had lost, and dumb as Naruto could be sometimes, he decided that trying to sit next to her today was not a good idea. That left him sitting next to Kiba and a really shy girl in a bulky beige jacket. He just hoped she wasn't a Sasuke fan, too. He wasn't sure he could take that. Hey, is it all right if I sit here? Yeah, sure. What? You aren't even going try today. Are you kidding? I can see the storm clouds over her head. I really don't feel like dying today. Fair enough. Grab a seat. Naruto sat down on the other side of the Kunoichi in training who instantly started fidgeting with her fingers and turning red. Um, Hanada is it? The girl nodded, mumbling something Naruto couldn't make out. Are you okay? You look like you're overheated. Maybe you should take off the jacket. That proved too much for Hanada, who promptly gained a full face blush and fainted. What happened up there? Came the call from Aruka, who had heard the thud at the front of the room. Naruto answered. Hanada overheated and passed out. At least I think she overheated. Maybe she's sick. Her face was red. Well, then let's start today off with a quick lesson in first aid. If something like this happens, get the person onto the floor, put padding under her head, and elevate her feet over her head. You might want to remove any clothing that would restrict her breathing. With the rest of the class watching, Kiba and Naruto followed Aruka's instructions, removing Hanada's jacket and using it to cushion her head. At this point, Kiba needed some tissues to stop his nose from bleeding when he got his first look underneath Hanada's jacket. Ha <laughs> ha, Hanada's 10, and she's already better developed than any of the other girls here. Score. Naruto just rolled his eyes and kept going. Man, I hope she's alright. If anything happens, I just know I'll be blamed. Soon, Hanada woke up, and saw Naruto bent over her, with the rest of the class behind him. Wh what hap peepeened. Uh, you passed out. You might want to keep the jacket off, or at least unzipped for a while. Hanada looked down at herself, noticing her jacket was off, and was about to faint again, when Naruto said, Hey, don't faint again. Kiba and I just got your jacket off. That proved to be the wrong thing to say, as that prompted her to faint again, with another full face blush. Aw oh, man. Sigh. Naruto. When she comes to bring her down to the sparring field outside. With that, Aruka herded everyone else out the door. Naruto bent over Hanada, making sure she was still breathing. However, he got too close, and Hanada latched onto him, hugging him to her. Naruto's thoughts were all over the place. Oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. This is bad. Actually, this feels kinda nice. Hey, she smells like lavender. Um, I love you Naruto-kun. Naruto went white at that. Wh what did she just say? Maybe she just likes Naruto slices with ramen. Yeah, that's got to be it. There's no way she meant me, right? He he he. You always look so cute with those whisker marks. Just makes me want to. Crap. How could she think she likes me? We don't even know each other. I'm going to die. And I don't want to die. Naruto managed to wiggle out of Hanada's clutches right before she came to. Un. N. Naruto K. Kun. A. Hey there Hanada um. Chan. 
Uruka sensei says we need to get down to the training field. R. Dot are you going to be all right? Hanada almost fainted again when she heard the chan added to her name. What kept her from doing so was what Naruto said about Uruka's orders. Oh okay. Let's go then, Naruto-kun. Hanada failed to notice Naruto pale when she said his name. Yeah, let's go. With that, the two headed down to the training field in an awkward silence. When they arrived, in addition to Uruka and their classmates, they saw the Hokage, several Junin, and three Anbu. When Uruka saw that they had arrived, he signaled for the Hokage to begin. All right then, I'm sure you are all wondering what you are all here for. Some of you may recall that, when you first entered the academy, you were tested to see where you stood. You are now midway through the academy, and we wish to see where you are at now. This will not affect your grades in the academy. It is merely for us to know how the academy is doing in teaching you as an individual, to prepare you for life as a shinobi. At this, many of the students, mostly Sasuke's fangirls, started worrying. They knew that this could be potentially embarrassing. For some reason, the academy placed a heavier emphasis on book work, and because of that fact, many had slacked off on physical training to gain more study time. The elderly Hokage continued, now rest assured that we will not be doing all of these assessments at once. They will in two weeks, and will be spread out over two or three weeks, giving you ample time to prepare yourself. Now, are there any questions? Sakura raised her hand. Um, Hokage-sama, what are we being tested on? Good question. You will all be tested on stealth, stamina, chakra control, weapons skills, jutsu, and several other categories. Is there a written test? Came a question from another student. No. This assessment covers the practical aspects of shinobi life. The academy gives you enough written tests, too many for my tastes. Personally, I find most written exams are poor indicators of how good a shinobi a person is. At this, relief flooded Naruto's mind, while stress entered the minds of most of the other students. A practical test. I stand a chance. Thank you, Kami. Now then, are there any other questions? No. Then let me explain the reason for the presence of all of these people behind me. They are here to help refine any skills you wish to work on before we begin the assessment. You will be spending all of this week working with them as well as continuing your personal training on your own time. Each day you will work with a different instructor. This will also serve as an example of what you can specialize in as a shinobi. Will the instructors please introduce themselves? Yash. I am Meita Guy, Taijutsu specialist. I am to help you improve your stamina. Embrace the spring tea ack. The odd man in green spandex suddenly clutched his throat. Sorry about that, Guy. I did that. I'm Yuhi Kuranai a genjutsu specialist, and I'll be working with my group on chakra control. Well, I guess I'm up next. The name's Serutobi Asuma, and I'll be helping with projectile weapons. Cough. I'm Gekko Hak Hayate. I'm Hak a Kenjutsu specialist, cough and will be working with Hak close range, armed combat. Cough. Cough. The name's Shiranui Genma, and my group will be covering tracking and stealth. I'm known as Inu, and my group will be covering ninjutsu. I'm not teaching any, but you will learn tips on how to learn jutsu faster. Following the introductions, Serutobi spoke once again. You should also know that Yumino Uruka has agreed to give lessons on basic traps. Now then, I suggest that you split up and choose an instructor. Naruto was torn. He couldn't decide which group to join for the day. The chakra control group was out until he got better at his clan's personal ones. Since he was able to evade Junin and Anbu to a degree, he decided stamina could wait a bit. Inu's group would probably be the biggest, at least today, so Naruto decided against that in favor of more personal attention. On the other hand, he knew he needed help with kanai and shuriken throwing, so Asuma's class was high on his list of priorities. The same went for tracking and stealth. He wasn't sure about what the Kenjutsu teacher could do, but knew what he was teaching was important. Eventually, he decided to take Aruka sensei's trap-making class. When the other instructors saw Naruto head towards Aruka, they let out a small sigh of relief. They didn't hate him, but they were nervous about his habit of pulling pranks on his teachers. Since they didn't know about his training with Inu, Yumino Aruka was the only teacher who Naruto seemed to listen to, 
and even he wasn't completely safe from Konoha's self-proclaimed prank king. When they were asked to help with this, the Junin all went to Uruka to ask for tips on how to handle Naruto. His reply was simple. There's no real trick to it. Just pay attention to him and treat him with respect, and he won't do anything too terrible. In other words, treat him like the other students. If his advice worked, it looked like this wouldn't be too bad. The week had passed quickly. Aside from a little awkwardness when Hinata was around, there weren't many problems for Naruto. He still wasn't sure what to do about Hinata had said, so he decided that he wouldn't mention it to anyone, and spend more time around her to see how he felt. What he was sure of was that Hinata was nice to be around, if a little too shy. Once the other instructors saw that Aruka's advice was good, they warmed up to Naruto. Apparently, either Inu or the Hokage had told Kurenai about the Uzumaki exercises. When she talked to Naruto about it, she commented about how even Junin would have trouble with something like that, and asked how an academy student could even attempt it. Naruto responded that until he had enough control to do the water walking exercise, the point was to hold yourself in place without touching the ground, and then push yourself out of the water. That left Kurenai and the other instructors, who had listened in, wondering if they could benefit from the exercise any. Naruto's private sessions with Inu-san had changed slightly. Instead of focusing only on the control exercises, the Anbu had also begun helping with the other aspects of being a ninja. Some of it, like a mini lecture on the meanings of all the hand seals and their effect on a jutsu, went completely over his head, but Inu-san said he would understand it eventually. He was also given basic training in the use of weaponry beyond Kanai and Shuriken, although Inu-san had helped him with those as well. After a discussion between Naruto, Inu-san, and the Hokage, Naruto was being given a chance to learn one of the two advanced Bunshin techniques Inu had told him about. Initially, Serutobi had been against it, asking why Naruto should learn an advanced technique before he could use the basic version. Inu replied that Naruto already had better control than most of the other students but still couldn't perform a basic Bunshin. After Naruto discovered he could now properly perform the leaf control exercise, Inu had him begin a new exercise, tree climbing, in addition to continuing the Whirlpool 1. He was nowhere near done with it, but it still put him slightly ahead of his classmates. After hearing that, Serutobi thought about it for a second, wondering aloud what the problem could be, although Naruto was the only person in the room who was unaware of the real reason. Finally, Serutobi relented and asked whether Naruto should try Mizu Bunshin or Suchi Bunshin. It was a tough call. Mizu would work with his affinity, while Suchi would work well just about anywhere he went. Eventually, it was decided to try and teach him Suchi Bunshin, as his eventual teacher would probably know the more common Mizu Bunshin. Now the three of them were in Naruto's usual training spot, so he could learn the jutsu in secret. Serutobi, despite his faith in Naruto's potential, still felt that he needed the basic Bunshin before he could move on. He had to admit, though, this did stand a chance of working. He was well aware that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing endlessly, expecting different results. Regardless of how Naruto performed, he would still have a new jutsu to work on. He was never so glad to be wrong. After maybe five or six minutes of Inu showing him the sequence of seals and Naruto duplicating them, Naruto was ready to try. With a cry of, Suchi Bunshin no Jutsu, his first attempt was underway. It was a remarkable attempt from an academy student. A large amount of earth gathered near Naruto, and an arm extended from the mound, flailed around, and dissolved back into mud. With a little coaching, he was able to manifest the entire upper half of his body for a second try. Five tries later, he had the technique down. Well, I'll be, congratulations, Naruto-kun. You proved me wrong. That is a proper Suchi Bunshin. Now, you just need to work on forming them faster and in greater numbers. All right, a new technique, just in time for that assessment. That reminds me, how come last year's class didn't do this? For several years, I have been arguing with the council over the academy standards and curriculum. I feel that the academy standards have relaxed too much lately. The focus on book work doesn't help, either. This year, for some reason, the council gave in, and agreed to an assessment of a class halfway through the academy. A set of standards was created for what should and should not be possible of those students. 
Should the majority of your class not meet those standards, the curriculum will be changed for the next year, in an attempt to fix the problems. I don't know, Oji-san. I'm guessing they did it so the Uchiha could show off. As if his ego wasn't already the size of the Hokage monument. Perhaps he is a bit arrogant, but hasn't he earned that right? Naruto could tell there was something important behind that question. How has he earned it? He's treated nice because he's the last Uchiha. The teachers always try to help him, even though he won't accept it. Then, when I ask for help, they throw stuff at me and tell me to go away. The way I see it, the only thing he's really earned is his class ranking. Sarutobi cracked a small grin at that. Once again, the Uzumaki mindset surfaces. A determination to earn what you have, rather than have it given to you. You might be right. Sasuke is treated very well, but he has earned very little of it. Some of it stems from the fact that he watched his family die in front of him at the hands of his brother, and is acceptable, to a point. Much more, however, may come because he is as a result of that, the, last Uchiha. One of Konoha's greatest weaknesses is the very issue we spoke of before I gave you the Uzumaki scroll. Then, when I become Hokage, I'm going to change it. I don't know how, but I'll do it. I wish you luck. The clans have grown used to their privileges. They will not give them up easily. Um, Naruto-kun, I have a question for you. Inu spoke up. What is it, Inu-san? You are listed as the dead last at the academy, and are generally viewed as a smiling idiot. Right now, however, you aren't acting like either. What is going on? Naruto cracked a grin. That's easy. Isn't one the of the points of being a good ninja to be underestimated by your target? And isn't another point not showing what you're really capable of? He got nods from both shinobi. Well, isn't the best way to do both to be seen as an idiot? The rookie of the year is expected to be the best out of his year. The dobi is supposed to be the worst, and is underestimated. This makes it easier to surprise your opponent. So, just how much of your performance at the academy is this, act? The academy. Not much. I honestly suck at paper tests. So parts of your personality are just an act. What about the orange? Naruto's smile dimmed a little. Sort of. It gets me attention, and I know it looks stupid. It's also my favorite color, and it's all any store in the village will sell me. That got the attention of the two adults. The elder of the two spoke. I wish you had told me sooner, Naruto-kun. I could have told you where you could buy something else. I've been to every store. Most chase me out, calling me demon and threatening to kill me. Hum. Well, I could have arranged to order you some clothing and other supplies from outside the village. Naruto perked up at that. Really? Could you do that for me, then? Just what you think would work? Certainly. Since part of your monthly stipend is meant to cover clothing and supplies, I'll just take the money from there. Thanks, Oji-san. You're the greatest. I try. The assessment had come, and was now almost over. Naruto had done well, better than just about everyone else. He guessed that most of the judges had wanted to fail him on everything, judging from their glares. Unfortunately for them, with the Hokage serving as another judge, they were forced to grade honestly. The last section was today, and it was the jutsu test. What they had to do was perform their best jutsu. Some would only be able to perform one of the academy jutsu, but some would attempt one of their clan techniques. The Uchiha had just pulled off a Kaden technique of some kind, and everyone started clapping, some louder than others. Next was Naruto, and finally Yamanaka Ino. When Naruto's name was called, the audience began muttering. Naruto was planning on doing the Suchi Bunshin, as it was one of his most reliable techniques at the moment. His second best was Futon. Daitapa, which he had found in his mother's jutsu library from the scroll. After that came the other two academy jutsu. What got on his nerves most were the comments from his classmates. The Dobi's gonna make a fool out of himself in front of the Hokage. Naruto sucks doesn't he Sasuke-kun? H.N. Dobi. Naruto's fists clenched as he tried to block the voices out and calm down. Unknown to anyone, one of the seals on Naruto's back began to glow. The kanji for ice. Naruto was about to start yelling like a little kid, shouting at his classmates to shut up, when he felt a strange feeling come over him. A cold, almost frigid, 
Sensation ran through his veins. Acting on instinct, he extended his arms and called out the technique's name. Uzumaki Haijutsu. Yomi no Oakawa. Kokaitis. From his hands spouted streams of water. Whatever the water came into contact with was instantly covered in an inch of solid ice. The entire audience was silent. Calmly, the Hokage stood, and made his way down to where Naruto stood, avoiding the spots of ice in his path. He walked over to an object that had been caught by the jutsu. It was a kanai, thrown by someone in the audience. Caught by the jutsu in mid-flight, it was now frozen to the ground. Examining it, he had one thought. What idiot tries to kill someone in front of the Hokage, and with a kanai that has the owner's name engraved in it? His attempts to free the kanai manually failed. Resorting to Kaden Jutsu, he noticed that the ice was rather stubborn, requiring more heat to melt it than normal ice would. To melt the patch of ice, he had to resort to Kaden, Karyu Enden, an act which seemed like overkill, both to him and to everyone watching. Breaking the kanai free, he hands it to an Anbu for further investigation. Turning to Naruto, Serutobi speaks to him in a voice only the two could hear. Naruto-kun, first off, that was very impressive. Second, you really shouldn't be practicing those jutsu unsupervised. Oji-san, I haven't even tried to do one before. All I know is that I was trying to calm down for this, and this weird feeling came over me. Then, I just called out he name, and well, this happened. Hum, I see. Well, I'll ask you not to try any of the other five for a while, at least not without my knowledge. Deal. Serutobi turned around to face the audience, who were currently either bracing for an attack or scared speechless. Is there a problem? Sheepishly, the audience sat down, and Serutobi walked back to his seat. Activating a jutsu like that through sheer willpower. Impressive. And the river jutsu seemed to require much higher level jutsu to counteract them. Good to know. Naruto turned around to return to the rest of the class, whose jaws were wide open. The exception was Sasuke Tem, whose teeth were grinding together hard enough to cause sparks. Dobi, where did you learn that jutsu? Didn't you hear me, Tem? Uzumaki Haijutsu. It's a clan technique. You don't have any parents. How could you have any clan techniques? Piped up a random Sasuke fangirl. Obviously, I had some at some point. The Hokage just gave me my mother's clan scroll a couple weeks ago. That slightly abated the looks. He sat down, and due to a sudden seating swap by his classmates, he found himself next to Hinata, who was imitating a turtle, trying to hide in her jacket. See Conger gratulations, and Naruto-kun. Thanks, Hinata-chan. You know, Hinata's really not so bad. That stuttering, though. I wonder if that stuttering is an actual speech problem, or if she's just really shy and nervous all the time. I just need to get to know her better. When everyone had calmed down, the Hokage cleared his throat and called out, Will Yamanaka Ino please come down? Ino stood up, walked over to Shikamaru, and drug him down to the platform. She then performed her clan's Shintenshin no Jutsu. It was nowhere near what it was supposed to be, but for a ten-year-old, it was still rather impressive. Serutobi stood, thanking the students for their performance, and the audience for coming. The students were dismissed for the rest of the day. Naruto sat in a chair in the Hokage's office, in a stunned silence. He had just been through a life-changing night. Some of his questions about his life had been answered, but new ones had popped up to take their place. The last two years had been relatively peaceful for him. After his performance at the assessment, the attacks on him had almost completely stopped. He still wasn't welcome in most places, but it was still an improvement. Since then, the most common physical assaults came from drunken villagers, who he could easily outrun. The worst one had been during the Kayubi festival after the assessment. A group of villagers and shinobi had gotten together, and broke into Naruto's apartment, intent on killing him. Naruto had been so terrified, he activated the second river technique, the Uzumaki Haijutsu, Yomi no Oakawa. Phlegethon, on sheer instinct. The resulting fire burned just about everything in his apartment. Naruto had survived relatively unharmed, but shaken up. The Uzumaki scroll had also escaped, strangely undamaged. It had been hit directly by the jutsu, but showed absolutely no signs of it. The Sandame guessed that somehow, the scroll was immune to the Uzumaki clan techniques, 
and possibly to most any damage, as a protection against the scroll being destroyed. He also guessed that somewhere within the scroll was either a jutsu or special seal that would destroy the scroll if needed. Beyond some clothes and supplies, not much else was recovered. The attackers also survived, but were badly burned. They were taken to the hospital for treatment, but were never heard from again. Later, it was discovered that, with practice, Naruto could control what the jutsu burned. He could command the fire to burn only a specific target, leaving everything else untouched, or to burn everything but a chosen item or group of items. Serutobi was aware of the possibilities for this. Naruto could set fire to a certain document in a group, burning it to ash, without harming the others, or create a fiery barrier, that only certain people could safely pass through. It was also confirmed that the river jutsu did require more effort to counter than their normal equivalent. The fire hadn't spread beyond Naruto's apartment, yet, in order to put the fire out, it required an amount of water that would have made more sense if the entire building had been on fire. Following the investigation, Serutobi found Naruto a better home. He was now under the care of Inu, or when he was off duty, Kakashi. Serutobi had gone through the Yandaimi's instructions for Naruto, and found he had misread part of it. Naruto still couldn't be adopted by anyone, but there were three people Yandaimi trusted to take Naruto in, if need be. Serutobi himself was one, Kakashi the second, and Minato's sensei, Jiraiya, was the third. He apologized profusely to Naruto for what had happened. Naruto didn't care. He was just happy to have some idea of what family life was like, even if it was just with someone who had become an older brother figure to him. Living with Kakashi, Naruto learned about the implanted Sharingan. This prompted the two of them to test out Kashina's theory on how to defeat it. Experimenting revealed that the Sharingan's ability to see chakra did take precedence over the ability to copy jutsu, at least with Kakashi's eye. With some minor adjustments to her original ideas, Naruto was able to prevent Kakashi from seeing what jutsu he was about to perform. Basically, Naruto had to channel extra chakra to his hands, but not use it in the jutsu. This would blind the Sharingan as to what was happening. However, Kakashi did warn Naruto that it was possible that a real Uchiha could somehow counteract this weak spot, as they would have better control over their Sharingan than he did. Since the fire, Naruto's wardrobe had changed drastically. Most of his old orange jumpsuits had burned. Of course, he hadn't worn any of them in some time, but had kept them since no one else would want them. Serutobi had done as he said and ordered several sets of shinobi clothing in Naruto's size. His new normal clothing made him look like a chunin, but without the vest. Now, the only orange on him were two stripes on the inside of his sleeves, since he still wanted some orange in his clothing. Serutobi and Kakashi also convinced him to buy some casual and formal clothes as well, for occasions where a combat uniform was inappropriate. Naruto's experience at the academy had also improved slightly. His book grades were still awful, but were better than they had been. They had gone up first when Naruto moved in with Kakashi, and again when Aruka became Naruto's normal teacher. He had spent more time around Hinata, and it showed. She still blushed and fainted when he was near but now he normally had to make an effort to get her to do so. Of course, he still managed to make her blush and faint without meaning to. The stutter was still there, but had also lessened greatly. Naruto still wasn't sure how he felt about her, although she was pretty cute, and he enjoyed her gentle, shy, and quiet personality. Hanada still wasn't aware that she had confessed to Naruto, but was loving the fact that her crush was actually paying attention to her. Sakura seemed blissfully unaware of the change in Naruto's attention, although everyone else in the class was wondering what had happened. The kicker had come on the day of the Genin graduation exam. With the exception of the written exam, Naruto had passed all the parts of the test. He had gotten a good laugh during the jutsu portion on the test. It had been the dreaded bunshin, which he still couldn't do. However, he had managed to keep the fact that he knew an advanced Bunshin Jutsu a secret the entire time, as a trump card. As he was headed down to take his turn, Sasuke Tem had started insulting him. In retaliation, Naruto created two Suchi Bunshin outside, which entered the academy and then entered the classroom, walked over to the Uchiha. One held him down, while the other gave him a wedgie. Both then dispelled themselves, pouring mud onto the Uchiha. 
the reactions of his classmates were mixed. At first, there was stunned silence, then the noise level rose dramatically. With the exception of Hanada, every girl in the room wanted Naruto dead. However, the other boys, except for Sasuke Tem, had broken out into laughter. Shino was the other exception, though those sitting near him swore they had heard him chuckle. Hiba began bowing down to Naruto, laughing while chanting, I'm not worthy. Having heard the noise, both Uruka and Mizuki had come into the classroom, to see the rookie of the year covered in mud, glaring at Naruto. After they figured out what had happened, they asked where he had learned such a jutsu. Naruto simply replied that he had a private tutor. Uruka promptly passed Naruto on the jutsu portion, and gave Naruto his new Hidai 8. Mizuki sent Sasuke home to shower and change. Afterwards, as Naruto was leaving, Mizuki had approached him, and asked to speak with him in private. When they were alone, Mizuki said that despite passing the practical exams, and earning the headband, Naruto's poor score on the written test meant that he would have to stay in the academy another year. Unless, he managed to pass a certain makeup test. Something about the test rubbed Naruto the wrong way, and he decided to ignore Mizuki's warning about not telling anyone, and talk to Kakashi. After hearing Naruto's story, the two of them went to see the Hokage. Naruto then retold his story to both Serutobi and Aruka, who had been summoned by Serutobi to give some information on Naruto's exam results. Aruka stated that if Naruto's overall score had not been high enough to pass, he would never have been given a hit I ate. That statement cemented Mizuki's status as a traitor. A plan was then hatched to catch Mizuki in the act. Naruto would be given the forbidden scroll, with a hidden seal that would destroy the scroll if it was separated from Naruto by a distance of more than 20 feet. It had to be the original, in the unlikely event Mizuki knew what jutsu would be inside. Beyond that, everyone would act as they normally would, from the Hokage alerting all active shinobi to the scrolls, theft, to Uruka trying to track Naruto down. The main difference would be that both Uruka and Kakashi would know exactly where to go, and the Sandame would be watching from his crystal ball. It had gone off flawlessly. Naruto arrived early, and acting as he had been told to, began to sit down and try to learn a jutsu from the scroll. He chose Cage Bunshin to learn tonight, and quickly took notes on some of the others listed, ignoring the jutsu listed as needing high chakra control or being part of some really complex jutsu. Mizuki had shown up as planned, and things went to hell from there. Despite both Aruka and Kakashi being there, Mizuki managed to evade capture long enough to break the law concerning Naruto. After hearing that, Naruto was stunned. He knew why he was hated, the explanation for everything that had happened to him. Uruka and Kakashi, who had gotten hold of Mizuki, and the Sandane, who was watching the entire time, were very nervous. This was a crucial moment for Naruto and the entire village. Depending of what happened next, Naruto could either rise above everything that had happened, or become the demon the villagers thought he was. While Naruto's thoughts were running in circles, Mizuki got in a blow on Aruka, trying to break free. The cry of pain shook Naruto out of his personal problems. He saw what was going on, and his eyes flashed red for a second, before returning to their normal blue. Once Naruto roared, Taju Cage Bunshin no Jutsu, Mizuki instantly lost, after he stopped to stare at the small army of clones that had been produced. Kakashi seized the opportunity, knocking the traitor out cold. After turning in Mizuki to the Anbu at the Hokage Tower, the three ninja entered the Hokage's office for a debriefing they wouldn't soon forget. Surprisingly to the three older men, Naruto took the revelation about the Kyubi in stride, or at least better than they thought he would. His only question on the subject had been to ask why he had been chosen. Choosing his words carefully, not wanting to reveal the other half of Naruto's lineage to both Naruto and Aruka, Serutobi told him that the ceiling needed a newborn, and Naruto was the only child born that day. If Naruto hadn't been used, the village would have been destroyed. Faced with that reasoning, Naruto grudgingly accepted what had been done, for the moment. He knew that except for letting him vent, it would do no good to complain about what had already been done and would only make him look and sound like a little child in front of three of the most important people in his life. After he returned the scroll, the meeting became a more typical of a debriefing. It was decided that this would be ranked as an A-rank mission, and would be listed in all three of their files as a success, with an appropriate reward. 
While an A-rank mission wasn't unusual for Kakashi Inu, it would look very good for Aruka, who had spent the last few years teaching full-time at the academy, something which normally caused one's skills to atrophy. Naruto's reputation as a new shinobi could also benefit, given how rare it was for someone with so little combat experience to survive an A-rank mission, let alone make a significant contribution to its success. Naruto felt a tap on the shoulder, breaking him from his thoughts. It was the Hokage, with Kakashi and a bandaged Aruka still sitting, looking worried. Naruto-kun, are you all right? Why yeah, sorry for worrying you guys. It's just, it's a lot to take in at once, you know. I understand. Why don't you go go home and get some rest? I'm sure you could use it. Yeah, I guess so. But, Oji-san, I have a question. What is it? When I used Cage Bunshin, and the clones dispelled, I felt this weird rush in my head. It kind of hurt. What happened? Ah, well, you see, Cage Bunshin is a multi-purpose jutsu. Used in training, the clones can work on chakra control and reserves, weapon skills, and jutsu, and when they dispel, you gain all the progress they made. The catch is, physical attributes, like stamina, can't be increased using this method. The original needs to do that personally. In combat, the clones have the ability to mold chakra and use jutsu. They just don't have the full extent of your reserves or control. It is also a useful scouting jutsu, because anything they learn is absorbed by you when they dispel. Your, weird rush, was you absorbing that information from all your clones. Oh, after a second, Naruto began to process the explanation, and began to arrive at a conclusion. And we all know what it is. So why don't you use them to help with your paperwork? Serutobi blinked. The clones don't last very long, even if they aren't in a fight. It would work, but I would have to create a new one every few hours. Okay, but even if you only create one clone, and split your paperwork with it, you'd be done twice as fast, right? Serutobi stood there for a few seconds. Then his eye began to twitch, and finally he put his head in his hands. I don't believe this. I've known that jutsu for over 40 years. I'm the professor of jutsu, and yet a 12-year-old genin, who hasn't even been out of the academy a full day, sees a use for it I've overlooked. I'm too old for this shit. Naruto sprouted a grin that was threatening to rip his face apart. Hey Oji-san, remember that promise you made me when you gave me my mom's clan scroll. I think I just held up my end of the deal. That got a chuckle followed by a full peal of laughter from the Hokage. That you did, Naruto-kun. That you did. Seeing the curious looks from Kakashi and Aruka, Serutobi said, two years ago, I gave Naruto-kun his mother's clan scroll. During that, I told him, completely serious, that if he could find a way for me to defeat the seemingly invincible enemy known as paperwork, I would personally train him. Naruto-kun has held up his end of the deal, so I will hold up mine. Aruka's jaw was on the floor, so Kakashi spoke for both of them. Hokage-sama, no offense, but how could you promise something like that? Why not? If he found a way to do so, I would be free to train him. As it stands, I'll not only be able to do my job here and train Naruto, I can spend time with my family. I might even be able to sleep at night, for once. Now Aruka spoke up. Okay, Hokage-sama but with Naruto becoming your only student, that leaves us with an unbalanced number of students. Hmm. Good point. Who would be the next in line to become a genin? A boy named Sai, Hokage-sama. He joined the class about two weeks ago, so his grades are rather low in comparison. Odd. I don't remember giving permission for someone to join your class. I wouldn't have done it anyway, so close to the graduation exam, not without a valid reason. Well, tell him he passed. Yes sir, Hokage-sama. Well then, I believe that about does it for now. If anything comes up, I'll let you know. Good night. A.N. Okay, for those of you wondering why Kakashi didn't make mincemeat out of Mizuki, here's my explanation. Kakashi and Aruka were supposed to bring back Mizuki alive if possible, killing him only as a last resort. That limits what Kakashi and Aruka can do, while Mizuki is fighting to kill. A good example is Sasuke and Naruto at the Valley of the End. The way I see it, which seems to be the general consensus, Sasuke was fighting to kill, 
while Naruto was fighting to capture, holding himself back in the process. True, Sasuke and Naruto are closer in overall ability than Kakashi and Mizuki, but my point was that if you aren't trying to kill the other person, and they're trying to kill you, you're at a disadvantage, normally. Two months had passed since Naruto became Serutobi's apprentice. Some of the Sandame's rules had taken some time for Naruto to get used to, like calling him Sensei instead of Oji-san. Serutobi himself was having trouble getting used to Naruto using a respectful form of address when speaking to him. Naruto's training was also rather unusual for any shinobi, as Serutobi wanted Naruto to be well-rounded in as many aspects of shinobi life as possible before specializing. In addition to the conventional ninja training, such as taijutsu and ninjutsu, Naruto had decided to learn to fight with various weapons as well. Along with kunai and shuriken, he was learning to use kama, various types of swords, and Serutobi's weapon of choice, the staff. With Serutobi's help, Naruto had also mastered the Uzumaki Whirlpool control exercise, walking against the current for over an hour. His ninjutsu training was more in line with what would be expected from a normal training session. Naruto would be shown a jutsu, and would need to demonstrate a certain level of competence with it before being taught a new one. Also, instead of catering only to his affinities, Serutobi had decided to teach the jutsu in a set cycle, so Naruto would learn jutsu from all five elements. However, his rotation was different in that for every Raiden and Kaiden jutsu Naruto learned, he learned two or three jutsu from the other elements. Taijutsu training was perhaps the most difficult for Serutobi to teach. Despite him being in excellent health, Serutobi was simply getting too old to teach taijutsu, especially to someone as energetic as Naruto. One of the best ways to teach taijutsu was a process of explanation, demonstration, the student's attempt, and finally sparring. The first two Serutobi could handle, and the third would be no problem but if he were to engage in a spar with Naruto, he would be too sore to move afterwards. It seemed to be one of the few drawbacks to only having one student. Maida Guy would have happily allowed him to join his team, and had made offers to that effect. Even though Guy would have gladly helped anyone who asked, Serutobi and Naruto declined the offer, as it would seem that the Hokage was giving special treatment to his student, and neither of them wanted the situation to look like that. Instead, an agreement was made, where Naruto would spar against Guy's student, Lee, every other day, with both senseis watching. Afterwards, Guy would critique their spar, and work with both Genin on improving their form. It wasn't perfect, but it was better than nothing. After about three such sessions, Naruto and Lee had developed a friendly rivalry. Naruto would also join Guy's team on random missions, to give him experience dealing with a team mentality. For Naruto, the most difficult training he would ever undertake had nothing to do with physical exertion. Serutobi was training him in the duties of a Hokage, as well as the needed abilities, like managing a budget and how not to accidentally offend a visiting dignitary. That meant that most of the lessons and lectures he had tuned out in the academy had come back to haunt him. Thankfully, Serutobi made a better teacher for those things than most of the teachers at the academy. Naruto soon caught up to where he should be, and added new lessons on top of it. Because of the cage bunch and trick, paperwork was nowhere near the invincible enemy it had once been. With Naruto handling the rubber stamp, level paperwork, and Serutobi creating two cage bunch and to split the remaining work with, the bulk of the day's labor was done within two or three hours, and whatever else entered the office over the course of the day was quickly dealt with as well. With his desk now regularly free of debris, Serutobi finally noticed the act of vandalism committed on it by the man who had been both his successor and predecessor. Both master and apprentice found the cartoon of a spiky-haired man giving the nice guy pose, with the caption, Namikaze Minato was here, hilarious. The etiquette lessons were rather grueling. The only thing keeping Naruto there was that, by now, he was well aware of how important they were. He had lost count of the number of times his sensei had been able to deal with someone calmly, and then vent any frustrations when in private. He vividly remembered the first time he had ever seen it happen. It was right after the Genin teams had been assigned. Teams 8 and 10 had both passed their second exams easily. Team 7 had failed, as was usual with Kakashi as the possible sensei. The catch was, the council had ordered that Team 7's failure be ignored. 
It was no secret that the council was sucking up to their precious Uchiha, a fact which disgusted just about everyone who had passed their Junin sensei's test honestly. Sarutobi had argued against it, pointing out how unfair it was to the other teams, those that had failed and who had passed. He got nowhere with that. Team 7's pass was put to a vote and was approved. Then someone asked if the rumors that Sarutobi had taken a new student were true. Sarutobi confirmed them, along with identifying Naruto as the chosen pupil. Immediately, the members of the council who favored Sasuke were up in arms, arguing for the Sandame to take Sasuke as his student instead. Sarutobi used a three-pronged argument to silence them. His first point was that he was under no obligation to take a student. He was doing this because he wanted to teach Naruto. Second, the council had no right to demand that a particular student be taken by a certain teacher. That was for the Hokage to decide. Finally, he pointed out that the council had just overturned Team 7's failure, binding Sasuke to Team 7. Following that meeting, Serutobi ushered Naruto into his office, locking the door and invoking a soundproof barrier jutsu. Then, he began to rant, showing a temper Naruto had only seen from the man when people had been caught trying to harm him. He prayed that he would never, ever give his new sensei a reason to get this mad at him. Like everything else involving his ninja career so far, Naruto's missions were unorthodox as well. As the Hokage's apprentice, Naruto often found himself running Serutobi's errands. Normally, that meant running messages and official documents all over the village, both tasks being chunin level, and counted as missions, varying between D and C rank. He wasn't paid for them, as it was one of his duties as an apprentice. He often performed regular D rank missions too, to earn some pocket money. He had even managed to catch Tora the cat single handedly, and was keeping how he did so a secret. One of Naruto's all time favorite missions, so far had been when Serutobi had to deal with village business outside the office. The business was important, but someone had to be here to hand out missions. There weren't any dangerous ones on the docket, just some D ranks for the genin. He eventually decided to let Naruto handle the assigning. The teams would receive their missions from him, and would report to him when they were done. Well, Naruto-kun, do you think you can handle this? I think so, Sensei. Four D-rank missions, with four genin teams coming in. Shouldn't be too hard. Yes, that's why I'm not having someone else handle this. Good luck. With that, Serutobi walked out. The four missions were garden variety, one of them literally. A villager's garden needed weeding. The other three were house painting, unloading and inspecting a shipment of new kanai for a local weapon shop, and catching Tora the cat. About 20 minutes later, the teams showed up. Guy's team made it first, followed by Asuma and Team 10, then Team 8. Team 7 showed up last, not due to Kakashi, but because two of his genin had gotten in an argument on the way over. Sai had said something to Sakura, resulting in him needing to see a medic nin. All the genin were wondering why Naruto was in the Hokage's chair. Sakura stared at Naruto, then piped up. Naruto Baka, what's going on? Where's Hokage-sama? Sensei had to leave on village business. I'll be handing out missions to all of you today. Kiba spoke up. So, you're getting a taste of your dream job, huh? What's it like? I like it. It comes with a comfy chair. This earned a laugh from those present who had a sense of humor. He then listed the four missions for the day. Sasuke walked up and was about to grab one of the scrolls when Naruto said, What do you think you're doing, Uchiha? Taking a scroll, Dobi, what does it look like? You don't just take a mission, it's assigned to you. You should know that by now. Sasuke was pissed. The Dobi was calling him an idiot. How dare he? He clenched his fist. Why I oughta, Sasuke. Stop that, Kakashi admonished. He's right. Until Hokage-sama returns, Naruto outranks you, at least for this. You would never have done that if Sandame-sama were here, would you? He outranks me. He's a genin too. Hokage-sama put him in charge of assigning us our missions. That puts him higher up in the chain of command. It also means that when the missions are done, we will report to Naruto as well. That shut Sasuke up. Naruto knew he'd never get anything close to an apology out of him. Well, since that's settled, on with the missions. Usual system. First come, 
first served. Gai Sensei, which one do you want? With Tenten in the room, Gai knew better than to take anything but the mission inspecting New Kanai. Team 10 left to go paint a house, and Team 8 headed towards the garden, leaving Team 7 looking for a cat. Life was good for Naruto. He had become a shinobi, was being trained to become a Hokage with actual experience doing the job, and he got to spend time with one of the handful of people he considered family. How could it get any better? He had no idea. Due to both his living with Kakashi and being in the Sandame's office every day, Naruto had a pretty good idea how his other classmates were doing. He saw the three genin teams every time they came to get a mission for the day. He knew that Team 7 was still having issues. They had failed their initial test, gotten it overturned, and hadn't gotten any better since then. They had currently done double the required amount of missions needed to qualify for a C-rank mission, but Kakashi kept taking D-ranks to try and build teamwork. If it kept up, they wouldn't get a C-rank until after the next Chunin exams. Sasuke Tem was still a brooding, stuck-up jerk, but now he was an angry, brooding stuck-up jerk. He felt that he was being held back because the Dobi was being trained by the most powerful ninja in the village, and he wasn't. Sakura hadn't changed at all, in personality, training, anything. It was enough to make Naruto wonder what he had ever seen in her. Sai was. Sai. Something about him just seemed weird. That smile just creeped him out. Team 10 was a bit better off, but not by much. They had the teamwork thing down, but their, unique, red non-existent, training style held them back. As a result, they probably weren't going to be in the running for most low C rank missions anytime soon, either. Team 8, however, seemed to be the best team of Naruto's class. They had the motivation Team 10 lacked, and the teamwork Team 7 needed. And today, Kurinai and the Hokage had judged them ready for their first C rank. They were in the office, waiting for a list of the available C ranks. Hmm. There are several options for a team with your abilities. Let's see. Looking at the list, Serutobi's gaze found its way over to see Naruto sitting there, watching what was going on. Well, I did say I'd do this when he was ready, and he certainly is. Kurinai, before I give you the mission, I have a favor to ask. Naruto-kun needs some field experience. Since I can't leave the village, would it be alright if he joined your team for this? That threw both Kurinai and Naruto for a loop. Naruto was surprised because they hadn't even talked about a field mission for him yet. What was the old man planning? I have no problems with that, Hokage-sama. He is welcome to join us. Good. Here's your mission. There was once a shinobi clan in a small, coastal country. About 18 years ago, the clan was decimated in some territory dispute. Their clan library is supposedly untouched. And as it happens, the last known member of that clan is currently a Konoha ninja. Your mission is to locate the library, and if it is still intact, retrieve everything you can, storing it in this scroll, Serutobi handed Kurinai a heavy-duty storage scroll. Are there any questions? I have two, Hokage-sama. Where are we headed? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. It's Uzu no Kuni. And the clan name, the Uzumaki clan. At that, the four members of Team 8 looked at Naruto, who was pale. S. Sensei, are you serious? Of course I am. I told you I would send you when you were ready. Now, are there any more questions? One more. How dangerous is this mission? Well, Uzu no Kuni has rebuilt itself. While they no longer have a shinobi force, it is rather peaceful, according to the most recent reports. I doubt anyone else will be trying to locate the library as well as it is protected in the same fashion most clan libraries are. Beyond that, I cannot be sure. Very well. We'll leave tomorrow morning. Turning to look at the four genin, Kurinai said, meet up at the main gate tomorrow at 7 sharp, with all supplies. We may not see combat, but I want you to prepare for it anyway. The four responded in unison, Hi, Kurinai sensei Shino spoke. I have a question for Naruto. Were you aware of this? Um. I've known about the Uzumaki clan and their library for a little over two years now. I didn't know that Sensei was going to give out this mission yet, to myself or have another team come with me. I see. Am I correct in assuming the jutsu you performed at the assessment two years ago is a clan technique, not one you created? 
Yeah, I've only got a small part of what the library supposedly has inside. My clan did a lot of stuff, so there should be a bunch of information on all kinds of topics, not just ninja or clan only things. Now Kiba joined the conversation. So there's stuff there that could benefit the entire village. Cool. All right you three, let's go. You can talk more tomorrow. Good day, Hokage-sama, Naruto. With that, Kurenai ushered Team 8 out of the office. Serutobi turned to Naruto. Naruto-kun, I'm giving you the rest of the day off to prepare for the mission. All right sensei. So, what are you going to do while I'm gone? I plan on helping Konohamaru with his training. He's been doing much better lately, and I know it's because of you. That brought a smile to Naruto's face. Shortly after he officially started learning from Serutobi, Konohamaru had stormed into Serutobi's office, wooden ninja tool in hand, and proclaimed that he was going to kill the old man. Taking two steps, he fell flat on his face after getting his foot caught in his scarf. Picking himself up, he promptly blamed Naruto, who had been two feet away the entire time. Naruto took a page from Sakura's book, and hit him on top of the head. Then Konohamaru's teacher, Ebisu, dashed in. After a rather annoying conversation, Naruto left to vent. Ebisu then took off to find his charge, who had followed Naruto out of the tower. When Konohamaru caught up with Naruto and explained himself, Naruto felt compelled to do something. After setting Konohamaru straight about why he should want to be Hokage, Naruto decided to teach the kid to do something he probably wouldn't learn until he became a genin. Of course, with the new curriculum at the academy, he might learn it there. So Naruto showed him the tree climbing exercise. For an eight-year-old, he did pretty well. He didn't have enough chakra to complete the exercise, but it was still enough to satisfy both of them. Ebisu, who had been watching from the trees, was so shocked, he fell out of the tree and was knocked out. While the two drug the Tokabetsu Junin back into town, they declared themselves rivals. Afterward, Konohamaru had done noticeably better with Ebisu. The two still met up when they were both free. Normally, they'd just sit in a training ground, talking and doing target practice. Naruto soon found himself acting as an older brother to Konohamaru. He loved it. The only problem he saw with his family was that with the exception of Ayame over at Ichiraku, he had nothing but male role models in his life. But hey, that could change later. All right, I'll see you when I get back then. Bye. And thanks for this, sensei. The five shinobi had been on the road for about six hours. When they stopped for lunch, the three members of Team 8 took the opportunity to question their classmate about his clan. Naruto edited some of the information he gave. After all, a ninja had to have their secrets. He didn't mention the notes on the strengths and weaknesses of their clan's abilities, or further explain his own. Perhaps the biggest effect this conversation would have revolved around Shino. Naruto finished explaining the Uzumaki view on over-reliance on clan techniques and Kekai Genke. While your argument is logical, it is not so easy for an Aburame to add to their arsenal of abilities. Our relationship with the Kikai requires that they constantly feed on our chakra when not in battle, limiting the extent to which we can improve. Fair enough, but what about Taijutsu? Or Kenjutsu? Maybe even some Fuenjutsu? Most of those techniques don't require much chakra. You could try those. Hmm. That may work. I will think on it. That's all I ask. Training on the road with Team 8 was a new experience. With the exception of Guy Sensei working with him and Lee at the same time, Naruto had never really trained with other genin. The teamwork exercises were well constructed, but Kurenai Sensei really couldn't teach him much of her specialty. He had the needed imagination and good enough control to be half decent at it. He just didn't have the necessary mentality for it, and often didn't pay attention to details. With few exceptions, the subtlety of Genjutsu just wasn't for him. He did, however, learn different ways to recognize and dispel Genjutsu. Kurenai had also told Naruto more about his mother. While Kurenai hadn't known Kashina personally, she was well aware of Kashina's reputation. Naruto learned that his mother had been a great Kunoichi a role model for what a kunoichi should be, second only to Tsunade. Kurenai had just been in the academy for a little over a year when Kashina came to Konoha. When she found out that one of her role models was now in Konoha, 
her and I hoped that she would get a chance to train with her. It was probably the closest she ever came to being a fangirl. She considered it one of her biggest regrets that she never got the chance. Uzu no Kuni was a good week to a week and a half from Konoha, two or three if you were to walk the entire way. The roads were well maintained, with villages about a day's walk apart, so keeping well supplied wasn't a problem. They decided that they wouldn't hang around in the towns any longer than they had to, even though there wasn't a set time limit on the length of the mission. They would also spend the nights camping. It was during this trip that Naruto came to a conclusion, Hanada should have been top Kunoichi. Yeah, Sakura had top book grades. Good for her. She and Ino would never have put up with camping out. They had been traveling for about three days, and made camp for the night. Naruto was currently on watch duty, and would be relieved soon by Hanada. He had no idea what was going to happen tonight. Um, Naruto-kun, I'm here to tea take over for you. Okay. See you tomorrow then, Hanada-chan. Come on, Hanada, you can do this. Just tell him. Uh, uh, Naruto-kun, there's something I want to tell you. I, I've be been in LL. I know, Hanada-chan, Naruto interrupted. Why you do? How could you know? Hanada was ready to faint, but kept herself from doing so. She had to find out how he knew. You told me. At Hanada's look, a combination of shell-shocked and questioning, Naruto continued. Remember the day we were told about the assessment? You had fainted the second time, and Aruka led the rest of the class out to the training field. I was making sure you were okay, when you reached out and grabbed me. Then, you hugged me to you and said you loved me. I I'm so embarrassed, Hanada squeaked, her face now crimson. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. Sure, I freaked out a little. I mean, someone I didn't know very well said they loved me, even if they didn't know they had told me. But, after I calmed down a little, I decided that if you thought you loved me, the least I could do was get to know you better. I is that why you started spending so much time around M me? Yep. A and what did you decide? I decided. I decided that I like you, Hanada. You're sweet, gentle, and just fun to be around. You are also probably the best Kunoichi in our class, skill-wise. You could probably have beaten Ino for practical ability, and Sakura for grades, if you had a more assertive attitude, but that's okay. I don't know if I love you or not, though. But give me time, I might find out that I do love you. A all right, Naruto-kun. Good night. Okay. Night Hanada-chan. I don't believe it. He's known how I felt for him all this time, and he wasn't scared off. Plus, he decided that he wanted to know me better. I might actually win him over yet. Now, Hanada was by no means competitive. If she had been, she would have left Ino and Sakura in the dust at the academy. Still, she couldn't help but gloat, at least to herself, that by just being herself, she was making progress towards making Naruto love her. He had acknowledged her for her abilities, and while he hadn't said he loved her, he did say that he might one day. Sakura. Ino, you both thought I'd never stand a chance at getting Naruto to love me because I was too shy to talk to him. Now, I'm farther along than either of you are with Sasuke-san. In your faces. With that thought, Hanada's face split into a grin that was normally found on Naruto's, and it stayed there throughout her shift. After a week of traveling, the group of five had reached the border of Uzu no Kuni. Just across the border was a small village, built near a crossroads where trade caravans would normally stop for the night. They would be gathering information on the location of the Uzumaki library. While none of them were able to find out about the library, they still found useful information. The Uzumaki clan were still highly respected in Uzu no Kuni. Anyone who badmouthed them soon found themselves in a world of trouble. It was a valuable lesson in information gathering as directly asking about the Uzumaki clan was regarded suspiciously, especially if the asker was a shinobi. Apparently, ever since the clan had been destroyed, shinobi from all over had come, trying to find their library and take it for their own villages. Even though there hadn't been any news of the clan, many still believed there was an Uzumaki out there, somewhere. If only they knew how right they were. Naruto decided that it would be best to keep his family name a secret as long as needed. If word spread around that someone was trying to claim the Uzumaki name, it would only complicate the mission, 
since these people would probably want proof, and Naruto wasn't sure what would count as proof. To anyone who had personally known an Uzumaki, the seals on his back might work, but odds were that most wouldn't know their importance, and only notice that most Uzumaki had a matching set. The most important information they found out was that the village near their clan home still existed, with many of the original families, who had lived there for generations. They had just found a lead. With their new destination, Team 8 plus Naruto set out, heading further into Uzu no Kuni, towards the coast. The next day, they reached the village, and looked around. The village had rebuilt itself, and the old damage was there, if one knew what to look for. When the villagers saw their Hitai 8, they almost started to tell the group to go away. When they saw the Konoha leaf emblem, they paused. Evidently, the entire village knew about the deal that had brought Kashina to Konoha, and were willing to give them a chance to explain themselves. Word of mouth spread, and soon the village leader came to meet the group. Konoha Shinobi, welcome. Might I ask what brings you here? Kurinai spoke up. Greetings. The five of us were sent here by the Hokage, on a mission regarding the the Uzumaki clan library, I presume, at Kurinai's surprised nod, the man continued. Yes, well, the other four major villages that clan members were sent to have also come at some point in time, with the same intent. They failed to find it. We are also aware that Kashina has been dead for 12 years now. Unless you can give a reason as to why we should allow you to stay, we must ask you to leave. I believe I have such a reason. You know she died, but do you know how she died? As we understand it, one of the nine Biju attacked, and she died as a result. That is only part of it. She did die when the Kayubi attacked, but she died because she went into premature labor, due to the stress caused by the attack. At that, the villagers gasped collectively. Wait, premature labor. She was pregnant. Then, the child. Yes, she died, but her child, her son, lived, and lives in Konoha to this day. We have come to retrieve the library for him. There was dead silence, the villagers shocked. That, that would be a very good reason, but it means nothing unless you can prove it. I can do that, Naruto, if you would. Naruto stepped forward. He couldn't remember the last time he was this nervous. Hi, I'm, I'm Uzumaki Naruto, the son of Uzumaki Kashina. The crowd surrounding them gasped again. Some of them collapsed, their legs unable to support them. This boy couldn't possibly be Kashina's son, could he? One of the older villagers stepped forward. I lived most of my life working closely with the Uzumaki clan. If you really are Kashina's son and an Uzumaki, you would have special marks. Do you have them? Do you mean these? Naruto removed his shirt and turned so that his back was to the woman. She then bent over, to inspect the seals on his back. Hum. Well now, you are an Uzumaki, I'm glad to say. The crowd just stared, the older people there with tears in their eyes. The Uzumaki clan wasn't dead after all. It lived. The leader spoke up once more. Well then, in light of this terrific news, feel free to stay as long as you need. I'll arrange for the five of you to stay at the Uzumaki clan house while you complete your mission. Thank you. It would be an honor. All right. This way, please. Naruto couldn't sleep. He was too depressed. They had been in the village less than a day, and he already felt more at home than he had in Konoha, until he had moved in with Kakashi. When they arrived at the Uzumaki clan house, they had split up to look for information about the library and its location. Naruto was looking through a bookcase when he found a family photo album. Opening it to a random page, he found himself looking at pictures of his mother. There had been a couple photos in his scroll, but those had been portrait-style shots. These were family photos. One was taken after she made Jenin, with her family around her. A second showed her getting a Chunin vest. Still another showed her after her promotion to Junin. Naruto turned back to the beginning of the album and started looking. He eventually had to force himself to put the album back. It was too painful. The pictures had shown that the Uzumaki were very close-knit. He would have been happy here, his mom's family seemed like great people, and yet he'd never get to meet any of them. One thing he did notice was that many of the photos had an island in the background. It had a building on it, surrounded by high cliffs. The only access point was guarded by a giant whirlpool. One that was much, 
much larger than could possibly occur naturally. There had been a huge town feast, in celebration of the return of an Uzumaki. It seemed like he was being treated like Sasuke Tem was treated in Konoha. He liked the positive attention, but he didn't think he deserved it. One of the villagers saw his discomfort and walked over to him. He reminded Naruto that everyone here knew how the Uzumaki clan felt about things like this, and then explained why they were doing this. The Uzumaki clan had a very close relationship with the villagers, and with all of Uzu no Kuni. They had been friends to just about everyone. The feast wasn't about him, it was the villagers' way of celebrating the clan as a whole and giving thanks that the Uzumaki backup plan had worked. It was a wake of sorts, honoring a group of people that were loved within the country. After that revelation, Naruto was able to enjoy himself a little more. Laying down, staring at the ceiling, Naruto wondered what to do. This place, something he had never known, had suddenly become a second home to him. He didn't want to give it up, not without a fight, but he had a responsibility to Konoha. Man, what am I going to do? This sucks. I feel at home here, but if I want to be Hokage, I can't live here. I just got a normal home, and now I've got a second one. Naruto's eyes widened, and then he slapped himself on the forehead. A second home. I can't believe I didn't think of this sooner. Even shinobi take vacations. I can come here on vacations. Gee, if I ever have a family, we could come down here too. Maybe my kids or grandkids would move here permanently. Naruto had never really considered having a family of his own, at least, not this seriously. The last time he had really considered it had been when he had been given his mother's scroll. Of course, he had blacked out, but he had been younger, and talking about him marrying and having kids was a little too much for him then. Deciding to clear his head, he got out of bed and walked over to the door that would lead to the balcony that surrounded the second floor. He expected to be alone, but instead, he found Hanada, doing what he was planning on doing himself, sitting there, watching the stars. Hey Hanada-chan, why are you out here? N Naruto-kun, hello. I needed to think and this seemed to be a good place for it. Ah, I see. Mind if I join you? Certainly. With that, Naruto plopped down next to her. Thanks. So, what did you need to think about? Or is it a private thing? No, it's all right. I'm just overwhelmed. Tell me about it. That's why I'm out here. What do you mean? We've been here less than a day, and yet I already feel as though this place is my home. It's a nice feeling, one I never really had in Konoha, not until Sensei found me a guardian. So what's the problem? I'm treated the way Sasuke is back in Konoha, and I don't like it. I've done nothing for these people, but they treat me like I'm a hero, like the Tem is back home. I don't think so. The Uchiha clan was treated like that in Konoha because of the Sharingan. No one has a feast like that for them because although they were respected and feared, they weren't liked. They were considered rather cold in their dealings with people, viewing just about everyone else as being beneath them, much like my clan, ununfortunately. They demanded the respect. Your clan, however, were apparently very friendly and dependable people. They earned the respect they got, and while you're being given that respect, it is only until you show that you aren't worthy of it. I would prefer it if my clan W would do the same, sometimes. Huh. Thanks, Hanada. I feel a little bit better about this now. So, why are you feeling overwhelmed? It's the first time I haven't been given special treatment because of W who I am or what clan I'm from. Inside the village, I'm Hyuga Hanada, clan heiress. To my clan, I'm a D disappointment. Out here, I'm just a Konoha Kunoichi, A and my reputation is what I wish to make of it. It's a liberating experience, but a little much to take in A at once. Yeah, that's true. Well, I think we better call it a night. Don't want Kurenai Sensei to get mad at us because we keep falling asleep during the day. All right, N Naruto kun. Deciding to do something different, Naruto reached over and pulled Hinata into a hug. As soon as he did that, Naruto knew it was the right thing to do. Hinata was so warm. If someone had asked Naruto to list the best decisions he had ever made up to this point in his life, this would have been at the top, no doubt about it. Hanada was unsure of what was going on. Her now not-so-secret crush had pulled her into a hug with no warning. It felt great, 
but her face was still red enough that she thought she was going to start glowing soon. She was both relieved and unhappy that the hug ended so soon. Relieved because she probably wouldn't be fainting in front of Naruto, and unhappy because she didn't want the hug to end. Well, good night, Hanada Cha MMPH. In a rare occurrence for Hanada, she acted on her impulses, and grabbed Naruto by his collar, pulling him in for a kiss. Naruto was frozen, barely aware of the fact that his hands were moving on their own, currently making their way to Hanada's hips. What in Kami's name is going on? Why is Hanada kissing me? And, hey, she tastes like strawberries. This is kinda nice. A few seconds later, they broke up for air. Hanada immediately realized what she had just done, squeaked, and ran off. Naruto was still stunned, so he turned around silently, and headed back to his room. In his current state, though, he forgot to open the door first, and walked into it, shaking him out of his trance. Opening the door, he muttered just loud enough to be heard by Hanada, who was hidden nearby, man, now I'm definitely not going to get to sleep. Had there been an inner Hanada, she would have been doing a victory dance just now, ranting about how Naruto was almost theirs. For the second time since they had left, a Naruto grin found its way onto Hanada's face. And in the race for love, Hayuga pulls out even further ahead of Haruno and Yamanaka. I've almost won, so now I just need to be careful about what I do next. A N. Hum. Some Naruto Hinata for all of you. Hinata was OOC because she's had two years of Naruto paying attention to her. Parts of his personality have rubbed off on her. She still stutters, though, but not much. Here, she only stutters badly when she's uncomfortable or scared, feelings she wouldn't normally associate with being around Naruto. Nervous, yes, but not scared. And if you think the villagers' feast was kinda contrary to what the Uzumaki would have wanted, even after the in-story explanation, you aren't alone. I had serious trouble writing that part. I wanted Naruto to be treated nice and to feel at home right off the bat, but I couldn't think of a way to do it without turning him into the Sasuke of Uzu no Kuni. You know, I never realized that writing backstory for this would be so tough. I have to force myself to remember that most of the adult Konoha Shinobi were academy students when Kashina came there. If you go by their age in canon, Asuma, Kurenai, Gai, etc., were about 14 or 15 when Naruto was born. Knock off the five years before that for when Kashina was first sent to Konoha, and they were 9 or 10, and in the academy. Kakashi was an early grad in canon, so I'm not counting him. The next morning was unusual for the five shinobi, two of them especially. Naruto looked like he hadn't slept at all, which was true. Hanada was acting shyer than she had in a long time, back to before Naruto had started paying attention to her. She was also having trouble looking in the general direction of Naruto without squeaking and turning away. The other three were confused about his, but neither Naruto or Hinata were talking. Turning to the purpose of their mission, they began discussing any possible clues as to the library's location that had been found the day before. No one had any ideas. Kurenai then proceeded to give them a lesson on gathering information from objects instead of people. She told them that in dealing with important secrets, like clan libraries, most people would never outright name the location, but would leave clues to its location, intentionally or not. She then asked if in any of their searches, they came across multiple references to a specific location. Hanada, Kiba, and Shino came up with nothing, but Naruto sat and thought for a second. He was rather ashamed of himself. The others had been working towards the goal of the mission, while he had been looking through photo albums. Just because it was his family they were dealing with, he let himself forget his mission, just to sit and look at photos. Wait a minute, photos. That island in the background. He proceeded to inform them about the island. As they had nothing else to work with, they would investigate the island. If nothing turned up, they would return and search again. Naruto knew that he had gotten very lucky with the pictures, and promised himself that he wouldn't let it happen again. He wanted to be a professional, and had to start acting like it. He could do what he wanted within reason when off duty, but on a mission, he expected better from himself. After breakfast, they began asking around as to the location of that island. Since the villagers were more than willing to help, 
they didn't have to hide their purpose, and were soon able to narrow down the location to an area that could easily be searched in a few hours. Despite the unusual properties of the island and whirlpool, the biggest clue was a dock in the background of the pictures. Only two or three islands were close enough to the mainland to be able to capture both the island and the mainland dock in the same photo. The first two islands hadn't matched the photo, even accounting for the passage of time. Naruto was hoping that the third would be the right island. True, he wouldn't mind spending more time here, but he wanted to accomplish the mission before enjoying himself. Business before pleasure and all that. Please, oh please, let this be the right place, Naruto begged to whatever higher power was listening. Suddenly, the island was in front of them. Hardly anything had changed between when the pictures were taken and now. The wooden planks of the dock were rotten, and the island was a little overgrown by the plant life, but that was to be expected, after nearly two decades without upkeep. Close by, they found a sealed cave. Opening it, they found it had been converted into a storage space, with rowboats and related equipment, all in good condition. Looking over the boats, they picked one out that could safely carry all five, plus Akamaru, with a minimum of discomfort. Working together, the five shinobi loaded the boat with their supplies and hauled it to the water's edge. Shino chose that moment to ask a question that had been on his mind since he had seen the island in the photo. How are we supposed to cross the whirlpool in front of the landing site? It is too large and powerful for us to navigate around safely, and there is no other way for us to access the island. Uh, Shino, I can take care of that, Naruto replied, scratching the back of his head. Hiba looked at Naruto questioningly. How can you do that? We don't know anything about this island other than your clan took a lot of pictures here. My clan developed a bunch of special chakra control exercises. One of them is moving on top of a whirlpool without getting sucked under. Wait, what, is that even possible? Shino spoke again. Interesting. Using a chakra control exercise is a barrier on a clan library. I don't believe anyone else has even thought of such a thing, assuming the library is on the island. Kurinai cleared her throat to gain their attention. Well, there's one way to find out. Let's go. Hey, why'd we get stuck rowing? Hiba was ticked. He and Shino had been told to row the boat, and his arms now felt like they were on fire. Kurinai replied, we needed two people to row so that everyone could fit in the boat, otherwise I could have done it. We need Naruto to channel the chakra to get us past the whirlpool, so he can't row. Hanada could have rowed, but it works best if both people have close to the same upper body strength. Now suck it up, we're almost there. As soon as she finished, the boat reached the outer edge of the whirlpool. Naruto immediately began channeling chakra into the boat. He knew he could do it properly with just himself, but this was something he had never tried, and he was nervous, making it harder. The boat tilted to one side, almost enough to capsize, but it went no further. Kurinai, Hanada, and Akamaru were holding down the supplies they had brought, while trying not to fall out. Hiba and Shino went into overdrive, paddling as best they could to get them out. All of a sudden, they were on the other side of the whirlpool, heading towards the island dock. When they landed, they decided to pull the boat out of the water, rather than trust the dock, which was as rotten as its counterpart. Naruto was exhausted after channeling enough chakra to cover the boat. He almost didn't hear the compliments directed his way. That was really good, Naruto. Way to go, and Naruto-kun. Most impressive. That was so cool. If it hadn't been for the boat tilting, you wouldn't have known that we were in a whirlpool. It felt like we were rowing through calm water. Hiba's statement was accented by Akamaru barking his approval. Thanks, everyone. I just want some time to recover before I need to do it again. You should have enough time. If you're ready, let's check out this island. Shino pushed his sunglasses up. One question, Kurinai sensei The whirlpool, how can it exist? The currents here could not form and sustain a whirlpool at all let alone one of that size. Logically, it should not exist, as it defies all known natural laws. Uh, Shino, I think I know. I told all of you that what we did to cross it was a chakra control exercise specially developed for my clan, right? Well, in order for me to learn it, I needed access to a stable whirlpool of a certain size and power, and those don't occur in Konoha. There is a jutsu that creates a whirlpool much like that one, which is how you perform it inland. 
I just don't know what could be powering it, though. Perhaps we will find the answer at our destination. Let's go. They had been walking for an hour and a half, just looking over the island while making their way in. Despite the overgrowth, to anyone who knew what to look for, it was evident that there had been trimmed paths here at one point, meaning this island had meant something to someone. After all, why build a dock and clear paths if no one could get out here? And it seemed that with that whirlpool in the way, only an Uzumaki could get out here. They reached the location where the building was in the picture, and there it was. It turned out that it wasn't actually a building, it was a part of the surrounding rock that was extended out, like an exposed tunnel mouth. Someone had colored it with some substance, making it look like it was built there, but it was probably made with a Doden Jutsu. After opening the door, they found that the interior was lined with masonry, leading underground. As they went deeper, using flashlights they had packed, they found the source of the whirlpool. It was the Chakra Control Whirlpool Jutsu, and was powered by several chakra seals. If they weren't renewed, the jutsu responsible for the whirlpool would run out in about 15 years. At first, this confirmed to the genin that this was the library, but Kurunai cautioned them that everything could just be an elaborate trap. Finally, they found themselves in front of a metal door. There were no keyholes, no hinges, no visible way to open it without risking collapsing everything down on top of them. Hanada activated her Byakugan, looking for something that would open the door. A hey, Anyo, there's a room on the other side of the door. A big one. I I can't see what's in the room though. Is there anything that could open the door? Um. W wait. I see some seals above the door. There are words in them. L let's see. Ice, fire, sorrow, hatred, forgetfulness, and memory. What do they mean? Weird. Hey Naruto. Any ideas? Yeah, I know what they are. They're markers for some of our clan techniques. I don't know what they could be for, though. Kurunai answered. Often, clan libraries will include a special protection seal that requires the performance of a clan technique to open. Why don't you try one? All right. Everyone stand back. Uzumaki Haijutsu. Yomi no Oakawa. Phlegethon. The fiery stream shot out from Naruto's hands. However, instead of hitting the ground and burning, the flaming water went up above their heads, twisting into the character for fire. Immediately, the door began to slide out of the way. Kiba took the opportunity to crack a joke. Hey, that sure gives a new meaning to firewater. But seriously, does that count as a Sweden or Kaden Jutsu? It's really a Sweden, but it could pass for Kaden. Oh, hey, why didn't you use any hand seals for it? Now that I think about it, you didn't use any back at the assessment either, when you did the ice one. What's up with that? On my back, between my shoulder blades, are special seals, probably the same ones Hinata-chan saw above the door. They are proof that I am a member of the Uzumaki clan, and allow me to perform some of my clan techniques without hand seals. So that's why you took your shirt off for that old woman. So there are four other jutsu, for the other four seals. Yeah. Kurunai interrupted the conversation. Enough. Let's see what is in the room. They entered the room looking out for any possible trap. What they found was a huge room, with some light filtering in from a camouflaged skylight. There was enough light to see where things were, but not to see anything in great detail. Hanada located a light switch, and turned it on. Still more chakra seals kicked in, powering light fixtures, and the room lit up, revealing bookcases loaded with scrolls. Kiba's jaw dropped. Holy crap. This is as big as the general library back in Konoha. Yeah, tell me about it. Hey, there's a sign over there. Naruto walked over to a sign that was posted to the wall. He read aloud, the original documents here cannot leave this library except in the case of the imminent destruction of the library. If you must remove a scroll, please take one of the copy scrolls in the bookcase in the corner. Looking into the corner, everyone present sweat dropped, including Shino. In the corner were two bookcases, loaded with heavy-duty storage scrolls, similar to the one they had been given before they left. Opening one up, Hanada exclaimed, I it has a complete copy of every scroll here. Already sealed in. Kurunai raised an eyebrow. You're kidding. The Uzumaki clan completed one of our mission objectives for us. Kiba joined in. Damn, they're good. So, do we pack up and head for home, 
or spend some time looking through this stuff. Naruto spoke up. I'd like to stay here a little bit. I still haven't completely recovered from crossing the whirlpool. I'd like to be at my best when we make the return trip. You're the only one who can get us back across, so I guess we're staying a bit. Naruto walked up to the bookcase, grabbing a second scroll. Hanada blinked, then asked, Um, and Naruto-kun, why did you get a second scroll? We already have one. I know, but the way I see it, this way, I'll have one copy, and the other will go into the archives in the Hokage Tower. I might like Uzu no Kuni, but I would rather not make unnecessary trips here if I can avoid it. Plus, maybe Sensei and I can go through the contents, and see if any of it could benefit the village. Depending on what we decide, copies can be made for the general library in Konoha. They accepted the explanation, and with that, the group split up. Shino walked around, looking at the various subjects contained in the scrolls. In a section on plant and animal life, he found a scroll on insects of the elemental countries, and pulled it out and began reading. Hanada had found the section dealing with medicines and healing techniques. She couldn't resist, and started looking through it, looking for ways to improve her salves. Kurenai, true to her specialty, worked her way over to the Genjutsu section first. She was impressed with the selection, but was even more taken aback by the inclusion of several Genjutsu that had long been thought lost. One of Naruto's ancestors had managed to either locate a scroll for the original technique, or recreate it well enough that only a true master would be able to tell the difference. She quickly asked Naruto if they had been included in the copy scrolls. He responded positively, and her squeal of joy echoed throughout the library, causing the four genin to look at her disbelievingly. She blushed, and excused herself for a moment. Naruto's first destination had been the ninjutsu section. Like Kuranai, he found several jutsu that were considered mythical. He knew the sandame would be foaming at the mouth when he saw them, the mental picture bringing a smile to his face. That quickly changed when he started looking at the kinjutsu section, and saw something that made him want to sit in a corner and cry. One of his relatives, his grandfather no less, had beaten Naruto to inventing the warok no jutsu. The hand seals, the description, even the name. He knew it had been his grandfather because he had seen the name in the photo album, and the same name was listed on the scroll as being the author. Reading through the scroll, Naruto found that his grandfather had created the jutsu at age 8 and for one of the same reasons Naruto had created it. The reactions it got were funny as hell. Shortly after its creation, it had been labeled a kinjutsu, much like the sandame had done when he had first fallen victim to it. Naruto had created the jutsu at around the same age, but had forgotten about it after he got his mom's scroll. He had used it frequently before then, but now he couldn't remember the last time he had used it. By this point, he knew that it was juvenile and not very useful outside of getting some laughs at the expense of his targets, its main use being identifying perverts. Still, it was his first, and currently, his only, original jutsu, and a source of pride for him. Now it wasn't even that. Almost makes me wonder what I'll find in dad's library when I finally get access to it. If he has a similar jutsu in there, I think I really will cry. Now, he and Kiba were looking around, slack-jawed at the varied topics. Botany, Kenjutsu, Agriculture, Architecture, Metallurgy, Sculpting. Was there anything your clan didn't do? Sit around and be lazy, it seems. Wait, I stand corrected. Here's one called a guide to cloud watching. Shikamaru will be thrilled. Snorting, Kiba noticed a door in the back. Hey, what do you think is behind this? Everyone gathered around it. No one detected traps, so Naruto opened it. It was about the same size as the main room, but it didn't contain more scrolls. One side of the room was a standard armory, with weapons, armor, and assorted equipment, outdated but still functional. The other side was storage. Furniture, jewelry, anything of value, was neatly covered and stacked. In the rear of this room was a solid steel door. Kurenai guessed it led to the clan treasury. Well, Naruto, it turns out we don't need this storage scroll from the Hokage, thanks to your clan's foresight. Anything you want to take with us? Just one thing, Kurenai sensei but I won't need a storage scroll. Walking over to the section of the armory dealing with armor, Naruto grabbed a hit I ate, covered in dust. Wiping it off, 
he showed it to the group. It was a standard Hitai 8, but the symbol was the Uzumaki crest. The cloth's no good, but I can replace that later. Let's go. Two days later, the group packed up and began making their way home. The villagers didn't want Naruto to go, but he promised that he'd be back. The assembled people nearly broke out in tears when they saw that Naruto had fixed the Uzumaki Hitai 8 plate next to his Kohoa 1. That evening, they were setting up camp for the night in a grove of trees, when a rabbit ran through the campsite. Hanada caught it, and brought it in front of the group. Kurinai eyed it, remarking, this rabbit still has its full winter coat. He should have started losing it by now. This is someone's pet. As soon as she said it, the rabbit bolted out of Hanada's arms. Kurinai then shouted, get down. The genin ducked, in time to avoid dying from their head being cut off. A oversized sword flew through the air, embedding itself in a tree. A man appeared from nowhere and pulled the sword from the tree. Kurinai identified him, Momochi Zabuza, demon of the mist. The one and only, A.N. Sorry, I just couldn't resist bringing Zabuza and Haku into the story. By my estimation, in this timeline, Team 7 has at least another month or two before they go to wave. As for what happens, you'll just have to wait and see. One of the more recent reviews pointed out that I was rushing the storyline. They're right. I am, and I knew it all along. I'm not apologizing for it, though. This is my first FIC on any site, and my first real attempt at writing something besides essays since I was in elementary school. That sort of stuff is going to happen. All I can say is that I'm trying to work on it. I used chakra storage seals as power sources for the library and its defenses because the way I see it, since the library was built in an isolated location, its power supply would need to be long-lasting and low-maintenance. Every other power source I could think of would have run out or broken down after nearly two decades of neglect. I eventually hit on the idea that if you can store physical objects in seals, and they keep indefinitely, why couldn't storing chakra in seals be used to power something over long periods of time? So tell me, what's a high-profile missing nin such as yourself doing attacking four genin and a junin? It's obvious, really. As a missing nin, I can't exactly go into a town and resupply. So, I have to get food and equipment from somewhere. You lot just happened to cross my path. Kiba growled out. Too bad we aren't going down without a fight. Guess again. Haku. Now, suddenly, water began to surround their arms and legs, freezing and becoming ice. They were all pinned. A figure close to the genin's height jumped out of a tree, hands clasped in a seal. Zabuza spoke. Now then, you can either surrender everything you've got and live, or do something stupid and die. Kurinai arched an eyebrow. Interesting. Your mission history and bingo book profile show you as someone who wouldn't think twice about killing. Why give us a choice? That's true. In true combat, I wouldn't hesitate to kill all of you. However, I have enough work cut out for me avoiding the Kiri Hunter Nin. I don't want Konoha or any of the other villages actively pursuing me unless it's absolutely necessary. So I'm giving you the chance to live. Consider yourselves lucky. Kiba and Akamaru were both struggling against the ice, trying to break free. Fat chance. Soon as we break free, you're as good as dead. The masked figure, apparently the one named Haku, spoke softly. I wish you wouldn't say such things. Neither of us have any desire to harm you. Once we have what we came for, we will leave, and my jutsu will end, freeing you. Please don't follow us. Return to Konoha. No way. You think you stand a chance against all of us? I don't care if we're stuck. We'll get out, and start kicking your asses. Haku sighed, and Zabuza growled out, you really have a death wish, don't you, punk? If circumstances were different, I might have enjoyed fighting you. Still, you should have kept your mouth shut, because now, I'm going to kill you all. The sound of ice shattering surprised him. Naruto had managed to break free without anyone noticing. It also surprised Haku, whose hands came out of the seal in shock, freeing the group. Well now, that is impressive. No one's ever broken free from one of Haku's jutsu before. I might actually get a workout. Zabuza began stretching and flexing the arm holding his sword, loosening it in preparation to attack. Haku, make sure no one tries to escape. Yes, Zabuza-sama. 
Haku jumped back into the trees and disappeared, ready to run defense for Zabuza and halt any attempt at escape. Well, I hope you've enjoyed your lives. They all end now. Zabuza raised his Zanbato, ready to charge the group. Then, his eyes fell on the Uzumaki crest on Naruto's Hitai 8. What the? No, it can't be. Hey, blonde brat, what's your name? Everyone else in the clearing face faulted. Haku fell out of the tree, but managed to avoid serious harm. What's going on? It isn't like Zabuza-sama to start attacking, then suddenly stop and ask a question. It's Naruto. Uzumaki Naruto. Zabuza stared at Naruto, a penetrating gaze in his eyes. Quote dot dot dot. Shit. You know what? Screw this. No way in hell I'm fighting you. Confusion once again took over the clearing. The demon of the mist didn't want to fight a genin. Zabuza-sama, is something wrong? Why would his name change your mind? I don't care how hard up I am for food and supplies. Nothing can make me willingly attack a member of the Uzumaki clan. I owe them too much. I'm sorry, but I don't understand, Zabuza-sama. I wouldn't expect you to know, Haku. I never told you. Didn't think I'd ever meet another one. You, you knew my clan. Naruto wasn't sure how to take this. What could his clan possibly have in common with this missing nin? Yeah, well, one member of it. I'll explain. Any of you know why I'm called, Demon of the Mist? By this point, everyone had lowered their guard somewhat. Enough to show that they wouldn't attack, but not enough that they couldn't get it back up quickly. Shino spoke. You killed the entire graduating class at the Karigakur Academy. A class you weren't a member of. Yes. Until I did that, the graduation exam there was very different than it is now. Before, each student would be paired up with another one in the same class. They would do everything together for four years. Then, for graduation, they would be forced to fight to the death. The victor made Jenin. Kiba winced. Wow. No offense, but why would anyone do that? That cripples how many ninja you can produce, and creates a lot of hatred within the village. Hey, what do you expect from a village that is called, the Bloody Mist, and is proud of it? Anyway, after my actions there, that was changed. The people in charge finally decided that it wasn't the best way to do things, though it had been tradition since the village's founding. Anyway, after I did that, I was up for a Junin Sensei. Not surprisingly, there weren't many takers. The academy wouldn't let me back, either. People were afraid of me, wanted me dead. Then, I was told that a sensei had been found for me, a man by the name of Uzumaki Kenji. Everyone's eyebrows were in danger of getting caught in their hairline. One of Naruto's relatives had been the Junin sensei for the Demon of the Mist. You heard me, Uzumaki Kenji. He was the best teacher I ever had. Wide range of abilities, though his specialties were Kenjutsu and Suitenjutsu. Taught me damn near everything I know about being a shinobi. One of the first questions I asked was why he was willing to teach me. He told me that Kiri had a serious grudge with his clan, something about them having some of the best Sweden and Futon Jutsu ever to exist. The fact that despite that animosity, the village was still willing to allow him residence was nothing short of amazing. He then said that because of that grudge, he was regarded much like I was by the village, as a potential threat, and that he was going to make me the best ninja I could be. He certainly kept his promise. Made the village even more terrified of me. After all, one of the most dangerous shinobi in the village was being trained by a member of a clan Kiri was on shaky ground with. Of course, when I managed the promotions to Chunin and Junin, no one could say I wasn't ready for them, mentally or physically. The entire time I was a Kiri nin, the only people I could never consistently beat were Kenji Sensei, the other swordsmen, and the Mizukage. Even after I made the swordsmen, I still sparred regularly with Kenji Sensei. At first, I managed to beat him, but he had never faced someone using a Zanbato before. After about three weeks of this, he went right back to kicking my ass. I asked him why he never tried for the swordsman, and he reminded me that he wouldn't qualify because he wasn't a Kiri Shinobi. Kurinai interrupted. I see. So then why are you a missing nin now? It's common knowledge that you tried to assassinate the Mizukage. What no one knows is why. It had to do with the Bloodline Massacre. Yeah, the Kagaya clan started the damn thing, but when it started targeting the other clans in the area with Kekai Genkei, the Mizukage didn't do crap to stop it. 
He encouraged the bloodshed, sometimes more overtly than others. After a while, the Mazukaj started losing support. He was making the entire village look bad by letting the civil war continue unchecked. There was talk of him being removed from office. What most people outside of Kiri don't know is the order of succession. When the Mazukaj is removed from office or dies without naming a successor, the first people considered for an offered the job are the active swordsmen, in order of seniority. After that, any former swordsmen that are retired, but still in good enough health and physical shape to take the job. If none of them take it, the opening goes to any active shinobi who can prove they've got what it takes. The Mazukaj was afraid for his job, so without warning, he disbanded the swordsmen, branding us all traitors. We fled Kiri, hiding from the Anbu and the hunter Nin sent after us. After about two years of this, I heard that Kenji Sensei had been killed, a bystander in a riot. Officially, that was what had happened. However, I knew about the grudge, and the details of the report were sketchy enough that it looked like an assassination cover-up, especially to someone trained to do that sort of thing. Wait a second. The Hokage showed me the report on his death. He thought he was a bystander, too. Each village's assassination teams do things differently. Different poisons, variations in weapons, that sort of stuff. Someone who knows what to look for could tell which village killed someone. Kenji Sensei's death had all the signs of a Kiri assassin. I knew that if the Mazukaj died, the swordsman could be reformed, to choose a new Mazukaj from our ranks. With any luck, the new Mazukaj would work to end the civil war, which I believe Kenji Sensei would have wanted. So, I decided to try and kill the Mazukaj and restore order to Mizu no Kuni. It didn't work, and here I am now. So, you aren't going to kill us because one of us is related to your late sensei. Yeah, pretty much, out of respect for him and a wish to keep living. If the Gaki were fully trained, I'd be in deep shit had I actually followed through with my attack. Kurinai looked at Zabuza for a long moment, then asked, so what do you plan on doing now? You haven't followed through with your original plan, and when we arrive in Konoha, we will have to report that we saw you, and that you have help. Yeah, I know, Zabuza let out a humorless chuckle. I don't suppose Konoha would take us in, seeing as I'm a missing nin. I wouldn't say that just yet. Six heads turned to look at Naruto. Hiba asked the question for all of them. What are you talking about? First off, this is completely unofficial, so I can't promise anything. Depending on what you're willing to agree to, there are a couple of options. You can try and become a Konoha shinobi. The Hokage is well aware that most missing nin became missing nin because they didn't like how their village was being run. Such shinobi can petition to the Hokage to join Konoha. I would still have to be able to see him first. Even if I enter the village in chains, I wouldn't be able to get a meeting with him. If you're serious, it can be arranged for you to meet him outside the village. We would just need to send a message with the general details. Are you interested? Haku looked over to Zabuza. Zabuza-sama, whatever you decide, I support you. Well, it would mean giving up on trying to become Mazukage and end the civil war, which was my main goal in all of this. On the other hand, I'm tired of being a fugitive. So what details do you need from us? Naruto reached into his pack, pulling out paper and a pencil. At this point, all I need are your names, former village or country, rank, reason for leaving, and any special abilities you have to offer the village. Except for your reason, we've already got most of that information on you, from your bingo book entry. We would need the stuff for your associate, though. My name is Haku, formerly of Mizu no Kuni. Okay, what was your rank before you left? I didn't have one. I was never a registered shinobi in any village. When I was young, Zabuza-sama took me in and trained me. Until then, I was an orphan, a result of the massacre. So you don't even qualify as a missing nin. Shouldn't be any problems getting you in, then. Why were you orphaned by the massacre? I, I have a Kekai Jenke, from my mother. I can manipulate water to form ice. My father found out. He killed my mother, but I killed him before he could get me. Naruto grimaced. I see. The village is going to love you. Much as I might not like it, Konoha is a haven for Kekai Jenke. I will be welcome there. All because I have a Kekai Jenke. And what do you mean you don't like it? Pretty much. As for what I meant, Konoha loves Kekai Jenke, 
to the point of almost worshipping some of them. The more powerful ones even get special treatment in some things. I acknowledge their existence and admit that they are useful, but I don't feel they deserve special treatment because of it. Ah, I remember Zabuza Sama telling me once about how things were before the massacre. The clans with Kekai Genke were treated as equals, not as superiors. Naruto finished writing. I wish I had been able to see it. Grudge against the Uzumaki or not, it sounded like my kind of place. All right, I'll get this to Konoha, somehow. Kurinai whistled, and a hawk flew down. Here, Naruto, this hawk will take this directly to the Hokage. Tying the message to the bird's leg, she set it free. It took off, heading in the direction of Konoha. Three days later, the seven shinobi and dog found themselves at a Konoha outpost on Hai no Kuni's border. The Hokage's reply had directed them to this specific location as a meeting ground. After waiting for about an hour, three figures appeared. The Hokage had brought Uruka and Kakashi with him. Hello all. I hope you two don't mind that I brought company. Standard procedure for things like this. It's all right. I was honestly surprised we got a response so fast. I thought you would have taken some time to consider whether or not meeting us was a good idea. Had anyone other than Naruto sent it, I would have. However, one thing that I have learned about Naruto is that his instincts about people are rarely wrong. If he thought you were sincere in wanting to come to Konoha, and that your reasons for your past actions are worth hearing, I will hear you out. After Zabuza and Haku told their stories, the Hokage sat and thought for a few minutes. Then, he spoke. You both meet my requirements for becoming Konoha Shinobi, but your reputation, Zabuza, means you probably couldn't be an active duty shinobi, at least not initially. You would be a reserve. Haku, however, has no record, and can be an active shinobi in whatever field he wishes. You could also become operatives for us. It's a bit riskier than the first option, but then again, why be a ninja if you don't want to take risks? You would supply us with information and goods not available through normal channels. In return, you would be paid and have access to Konoha's safe houses across the elemental countries. If I were to become a reserve shinobi, what would my duties be? Hmm. Your daily duties would most likely be in the armory, forging or inspecting. That, or maintaining our emergency equipment and shelters. If you want, you could also be called upon to serve as an exam proctor for the Chunin exams. Also, if you were willing, we would ask you on occasion to train some shinobi in Kenjutsu. I thought a village like yours would have several accomplished Kenjutsu users. We do have many Kenjutsu specialists, but out of all of them, only one, Gekko Hayate, is also a capable teacher. I find that unacceptable, and since those of the mist are trained to use a sword in the academy, you would be a perfect choice for another teacher. Would I be able to choose my students? Within reason, of course. Haku spoke. What of me, Hokage-sama? You have no record as an active shinobi for any village. While this means you are free to join us, it also means we have nothing to compare your abilities with. Procedure states that in such cases, I cannot enlist you as anything above a chunin, regardless of what you are really capable of. After you settle in, you would be tested to determine your starting rank. Naruto has also made me aware about your Kekai Genke. If you decide to become a Konoha shinobi, the village council will find out about it and they do have a say in the terms of your moving into the village. They may make a condition that would require you to breed your Kekai Genke. Breed. It isn't quite as bad as it sounds. It simply requires that you have multiple children, in hopes of passing on the Kekai Genke. It can also be arranged for in vitro fertilization if you want. Then, may I make a condition as well? At Serutobi's nod, Haku continued. Wherever Zabuza Sama goes, I will follow. If Konoha wants my Kekai Genke, they will have to accept Zabuza Sama as well. That is acceptable to me. Have the two of you reached a decision? I'll join. Me too. All right. Now, Haku, should you make Chunin, what specialty would you like to pursue? Truthfully, I have no idea. I would, however, request non combat duty. Something sedate, at least until I can adjust and make a decision. Fair enough. Let's see. Ah, Uruka, have you filled Mizuki's position at the academy yet? No, I haven't, Hokage-sama. That would work. It isn't quite sedate, but it isn't combat. At least, 
Not the sort you would expect. It would also help you adjust to how we do things in Konoha. Thank you, Hokage-sama. With that, the group of ten humans and one canine set of towards Konoha. A.N. Well, there you have it. One of my few complaints with most storylines that save Zabuza and Haku is that Zabuza is almost instantly accepted into the active duty ranks. I just don't see that happening that fast. Two weeks had passed since the mission to Uzu no Kuni. Zabuza and Haku had become Konoha Shinobi without much incident. Zabuza was given six months of probation before he could be considered for active duty. His first act as a Konoha Shinobi had been to find Gekko Hayate and challenge him to a spar, to gauge himself against the man known as the top swordsman in Konoha. Hayate accepted, and the match was witnessed by the Hokage and several other Shinobi. The result wound up being a draw, as the training ground it took place at needed complete restoration afterwards. Haku had been granted Chunin rank, and had been assigned to the academy, as Aruka's assistant. He soon discovered that he enjoyed working there. He also discovered a new appreciation for his Kekai Genke, as certain aspects of it, like his mirrors, turned out to be very useful in dealing with the students. It allowed him to break up fights and catch cheating students almost immediately. His biggest issue with Konoha life were his, admirers. When they first announced his acceptance into the village, he suddenly had villagers trying to bribe him into marrying into their families. Even though Haku had been referred to throughout the speech as male, several people had not heard it, resulting in several offers to marry their sons. Haku put up with this for three days, before he ended it, by walking into a public men's room and using the urinal. The villagers with sons withdrew their offers, embarrassed. That still left the families with girls, though. In addition to the payment for a successful C-rank mission, Naruto and Team 8 received a bonus for bringing in two talented shinobi and a new Kekai Genke to the village. Naruto tried to return his portion of the mission payment, saying that since he profited personally from the mission, he didn't need the money. Sarutobi and Kurinai countered by saying that since he did not hire the team for the mission, he would still be paid. The same would have held true even if the mission had come from the Hyuga, Abarame, or Inazuka clans. Naruto grudgingly accepted the money after that. One afternoon, the current active genin cells were having a meeting in the Hokage's office. It was Serutobi's idea, so that the Junin sensei could exchange ideas about how to best train their teams, and just compare progress. It was optional for the Genin to attend, so Sasuke had declined, preferring to train alone. Sakura had also declined, hoping to get a date with the Uchiha. Ino hadn't known Sasuke wasn't coming, so she was at the meeting. Teams 8 and 10, Guy's team, Kakashi, Sai, and Naruto were sitting, waiting for the Hokage to speak. Serutobi cleared his throat. All right, it looks like everyone is here that is going to show. Let's begin. How about a general team progress report? Kakashi, why don't you start? Hi, Hokage-sama. Team 7 is, still not ready for AC rank. Judging by individual ability, Sai and Sasuke are ready for the bigger stuff. As a whole, though, they still lack the necessary teamwork for a successful mission. Sasuke continues to believe that the others, including me to a degree, are holding him back, and won't work with them. As a result, I'm running low on new teamwork exercises to have them do. Why you? And what about Sakura? I include myself because I find myself constantly telling them that they aren't ready for harder missions. Sasuke may see that as me holding him back from, and I quote, gaining more power. Sakura has improved from when she graduated, but not as much as I would have liked. She's improved her chakra control with the tree climbing exercise, and as well enough with the other genin level exercises have had her do. Unfortunately, she is currently unable to properly concentrate whenever Sasuke is around, which on a C rank mission could spell disaster. I've been trying with varying degrees of success to rid Sakura of her fangirl habits. To her credit, she makes an honest effort every time, but after a while, she backslides, and we have to start all over again. Asuma raised an eyebrow. Weird. What got her so focused on improving herself all of a sudden? Everything she's done has screamed. Fangirl. It happened about a month or so ago. Kakashi sighed. We had just finished training for the day. Sai and Sasuke had already left. Sakura came up to me, rather depressed. 
She said she felt she was a burden to her team, and was considering returning to civilian life. I asked why she felt that way, and she replied that she wasn't showing improvement in any area. I had noticed this, and had been trying to find a way to talk to her about it for some time. I asked her to tell me about her training regimen. She described something a civilian would do to maintain their current weight. A ninja would only do that routine as part of rehabilitation after a serious injury. I told her that, and offered to help, but only if she would take her training seriously. She agreed, and has shown marked improvement ever since. So why is she backsliding? She backslides because she is on a team with the reason she became a fangirl in the first place. I can help her with the physical aspects of shinobi life, but I'm helpless at training Kunoichi mentally. Ino huffed. She's probably trying to impress Sasuke-kun. As if she could. I'm going to. Ino. Asuma put his hand on her shoulder. I didn't want to say this in front of everyone, but your training is suffering because of the Uchiha too. You don't eat properly, and as a result, you can't train properly. Is it a crime to watch my figure? I don't want to gain weight, so I'm on a diet. It isn't a crime, but it could cost you dearly later. Besides, if you increase your training regimen, you'll burn off the extra calories anyway. Naruto added, you know, Pretty much the only thing you and the rest of the Uchiha's fangirls haven't tried doing to win him over is take your duties as Kunoichi seriously. Ino glared at him. I'll have you know that a lot of Kunoichi are chosen for missions because of their looks. Looking our best is one of our duties for those missions. Kiba snorted. Yeah, but you don't get those kinds of missions until you're at least 15 or 16 in a chunin. Naruto's right. Maybe if you try being a real Kunoichi, you'll stand a chance with him. Something in the eyes of the boys that knew Sasuke said that they didn't think it would work. Ino didn't notice. You think so? Asuma sensei, I'll be at the training ground. With that, Ino blasted out of the Hokage's office, heading towards the training grounds. Naruto blinked, then asked, Okay, I need a judgment call on something. How gold guilty I feel about what we just did. I mean, we shouldn't manipulate our comrades like that but we did it so Ino would work on being a better Kunoichi, even if she's doing it for the wrong reasons. Asuma thought for a moment, then replied, you're right, it isn't good to push the buttons of your fellow shinobi like that, but now that she found the determination to improve, Shikamaru, Choji, and I can work with her until she's improving for the right reasons. All things considered, it was a big carrot and a little stick. Sai looked up from his drawing. In a complete deadpan, he said, Funny you should say that, Serutobi-san, considering she's after the Uchiha. A little stick is exactly what he's got to work with. The higher-ranking shinobi, along with Neji and Shino, managed to keep a straight face, though the adults were cracking up inside. Hanada was looking very uncomfortable listening to comments on the supposed shortcomings of one of her classmates. Tenton was trying not to laugh, and failing. The other boys, however, didn't even try to stop themselves, laughing out loud. When they calmed down, the meeting continued. The next day, Serutobi was talking to Naruto in the training field they normally used. Naruto-kun, you've met, and in several cases, surpassed, every expectation I had for you. As a result, I think it's time we stepped up your training. Okay sensei, but what do you mean by stepping it up? Up to now, I have had you do everything as one person. Now we will start incorporating Cage Bunshin into your training. You already know that they can be used to perform extra work, and now I'm going to help you make the most of your unique proficiency with that jutsu. What's that supposed to mean? Naruto-kun, no one else has ever been able to make as many as you can. That means that if you use them wisely, you can benefit more than anyone else. Right now, why don't you make about, oh, 50 Cage Bunshin? Then, Split them into three groups. Twenty will work on chakra control, another twenty on kanai and shuriken training. The final ten will come with us and work on an advanced jutsu. We can adjust the numbers later if we need. Just one jutsu, sensei. If I have ten clones helping me, couldn't I learn eleven? Yes, you can, but I would rather you have a handful of jutsu that you can perform properly, instead of a large amount of jutsu you can't. If you want to use them that way, you are free to do so on your own time. Here, 
However, we'll do it my way. Oh, I get it. Same system as before. Get this one right, and then move on. All right. Naruto created the 50 clones, sorting them into their groups. So, sensei, what's the jutsu? Today, you'll be learning Sweden. Tepotama Renden. Naruto slowly left the training ground, completely exhausted. Because of his clones, he had gotten the jutsu down in a short amount of time. As a result, Sarutobi decided to move on to a jutsu from Naruto's clan library. The one they eventually decided on was one neither of them knew, so they would both walk away from today's training with at least one new jutsu. By the time they were done for the day, Sarutobi had two new jutsu, and Naruto had three. It had been Sarutobi's first chance to really see what had been brought back from Uzu no Kuni. The mission report said there were legendary jutsu in the scroll, and Kurenai had listed some of them by name, but he still wasn't prepared to actually see the seals holding the scrolls right in front of him. It took nearly all of Sarutobi's willpower not to unseal the scrolls and jump up and down, screaming gleefully at the top of his lungs, like Naruto had done when he was younger. Of course, every now and then, Naruto would still do that, but it was a rare occurrence. The first jutsu they chose to learn wasn't legendary, but it was rather obscure, almost forgotten. Sarutobi had only heard of it in the history lectures his teachers, the Shodai and Nadaim Hokages, had given him when he was Naruto's age. Looking over the notes in the jutsu scroll, he realized that this was not the original jutsu. It had been reverse engineered some time ago, and given to the Uzumaki clan as a wedding gift, apparently. Ninpu. Surugi no Cave was a variant on Kanai or Shuriken Cage Bunshin. In theory, it was rather simple. A sword would be duplicated many times. Then, chakra would be applied to position and manipulate the swords. The swords would remain in a fixed location, by default pointing vertically up, but their angle could be adjusted to skewer anything it came into contact with, giving the jutsu both defensive and offensive capabilities. Manipulating their formations, it was supposedly possible to create a wall of great height and width, though doing that sacrificed part of its defensive abilities by spreading the swords out. The jutsu proved rather demanding. Creating the extra swords took a sizable amount of chakra, and forming and adjusting the wall needed at least chunin level control. In order for Naruto to understand how it worked, Sarutobi demonstrated Kanai, Shuriken Cage Bunshin. He didn't show Naruto the seals, saying he wasn't quite ready for it, that he would need to work on seal speed before he could learn it. Naruto wasn't happy about it, but there was a good reason and he wasn't being denied the jutsu completely. Like everything Sarutobi taught him, he would learn it when he was ready, and not before. Overall, both master and apprentice felt Sarugi no Cave was a useful jutsu to know. A footnote said there was a similar, slightly easier jutsu among the scrolls. Locating it, they decided to try that one too. This one was an original, though it was given to the Uzumaki as payment for something, a mission of some sort, most likely. Doden. Yari no Cave proved to be much more to their liking. Another jutsu that was both defensive and offensive, it needed less control and the amount of chakra consumed depended on the user's needs. The more chakra applied, the bigger the effect. On use, a miniature forest of sharp stone spears would shoot up from the ground in any direction the user wanted, so it was possible to surround a target, completely trapping them. The spears came up to the middle of Sarutobi's chest, so jumping over them wasn't an option. The downside was that the spears were anchored to the ground, making them relatively useless against an aerial attack. When Naruto asked why a Doden Jutsu was given as payment to a clan of Sweden and Futon users, Sarutobi replied that, to civilians in a non-shinobi village, a jutsu was a jutsu. Deciding that was enough jutsu training for one day, Sarutobi had Naruto move on to the next segment in his training regimen. As Naruto passed a restaurant, he noticed four diners in particular. Asuma, Kakashi and Kurenai were sitting at the same table, along with a tokubetsu junin Naruto often ran into when delivering messages to the interrogation department, Mitarashi Anko. She was okay. Crazy as hell, but okay. Asuma and Kakashi had notebooks with them, and were writing in them. Racking his brain for a reason why the four of them would be together, Naruto remembered that after the meeting, Kurenai had offered to give the two men advice on how to permanently defend girl Sakura and Ino. Anko was probably there to help as well. Apparently, 
Akunoichi can only be cured of being a fangirl through the intervention of other, stronger Kunoichi. Or, at least, that was Naruto's best guess. He just hoped that it wouldn't get bad enough to where Kurenai and Anko would take a more involved role with his two classmates. Neither of them were at all patient with Kunoichi who didn't take training seriously. He was snapped out of his thoughts when he heard Kakashi call him over. What's up, Kakashi? You done training for the day? Yeah, I am. I figured I'd go home, shower, change, and then find something to eat. Why? Well, we're almost out of a couple things, and completely out of some others. Could I talk you into doing some grocery shopping? Okay, sure. What do we need? Kakashi turned to the very back of his notebook. Some of the things Naruto saw on the pages were probably the tips for Sakura. The rest seemed to be notes on some new teamwork exercises, a couple of which Naruto recognized from the mission with Team 8. Kakashi ripped out a piece of the page and jotted down a list of about 10 items. Here you go. Thanks, Naruto. No problem. See you at home. With that, Naruto took off. Once Naruto was out of earshot, Asuma asked a question. So, Kakashi, tell us something. Exactly how stable is he? Kakashi narrowed his eye. What's that supposed to mean? Sorry. That came out wrong. What I meant was, are there any signs of his, oh, what's the word dad likes using? Got it. His tenant. Anything new besides what we already know. You and dad are the two who spend the most time around him. The only signs we've noticed are mostly physical. The whisker marks, his rapid healing, and ungodly stamina. His reserves are enormous, to the point where if he concentrates, he can actually create a visible aura of chakra. Problem is, because of that, his control will need constant work. Double, maybe triple the amount anyone else would need, just to keep it in check. Mentally, though, we've absolutely no clue. He's been on his own so long, without anyone able to regularly check on him, there's no way to know if he's always been the way he is now. He told me that he used to keep a journal, but they were always destroyed by the villagers, so he stopped. Anko whistled. Crap. So he may very well be a time bomb. Yeah. Although, if that proves to be the case, the positive turn his life has taken in the last couple years may be enough to buy us time to, to defuse the situation. Personally, I don't think there's going to be a problem, so long as no one tries anything stupid. The most anyone's done to him since he moved in with me has been glaring, or yelling insults if they're drunk. Even that has become almost non-existent since Hokage-sama started training him. Well, yeah, he's the Hokage's student. No Konoha citizen in their right mind would attack someone under his protection. You forget, he's had the Hokage's protection his entire life. It was ignored. Any attack on Naruto has always been considered treason, and punished as such. The only difference is, now Sandame sama is taking an active role in it. Right now, an attacking Naruto would be seen as an attack on Sandame sama which no one in the village would want to admit to being a part of. So were there any problems when he moved in? There were a couple. Before Naruto moved in, Sandame sama had me talk to a specialist, a child psychologist who dealt with cases like this. She explained some of the difficulties that were more than likely going to crop up as a result from Naruto being on his own for so long. So far, she's been pretty accurate. Naruto had a tough time adjusting at first, and it shows up again every once in a while. Despite the fact that he seems like an open book, he's actually rather private with most things. He's also unsure on how to handle his emotions at times. He understands them, he just doesn't always know what to do about them. Anko cleared her throat. As riveting as this is, could we get back to what we came here for? Asuma, what I think would work best for Eno is aggressive negative stimuli therapy. Asuma's jaw dropped. Anko, are you nuts? I want Eno to take her training seriously. Why would you even suggest that? Getting back on topic, the discussion continued for several more hours. An. Okay. Now for an explanation for Sakura trying not to be a fangirl so early on. She still tends to think of Naruto as the, Dobi. The catch is, since she isn't on a team with someone she thinks of as a worse ninja than herself, she got hit with the whole, I'm just dead weight, insecurity issue early. Kakashi took advantage of this, and started getting her to improve herself, so she wouldn't feel like that. 
The problem is, since she's on the same team as the object of her affections, it's a continual battle to maintain her will to improve. Naruto exited the bathroom of the apartment he shared with Kakashi. The groceries had already been put away, and he had just finished his shower. Time for food. Now then, do I eat here or at Ichiraku's? What am I saying? Ichiraku's, of course. Deciding to wait a little bit before going, Naruto grabbed his copy of his clan library scroll. Let's see. What to read, what to read. Hum. The Uzumaki clan and the rivers of Hades. Naruto unsealed the spot marked, revealing another scroll. He opened it, and began to read. It turned out that the scroll was an account on how the Uzumaki clan supposedly gained the river techniques, and the changes made to them in the time since. Shortly after the founding of the Shinobi nations, the Shinigami came for the soul of a dying infant of the Uzumaki clan. When he arrived, he reached for the soul, but it would not leave the body. The body was dying, but the infant was clinging to life through willpower alone. The Shinigami knew this sort of thing happened on occasion, but it happening in infants, especially ones not in a hospital, was very rare. The Shinigami made himself visible to the members of the clan standing vigil around the infant. They reacted as one would expect. The Shinigami, in an almost unheard of act, offered his condolences at the situation. He told them that had a job to fulfill, but taking infants and children was never easy for him. The clan head stepped forward, telling him that the child was dying from a birth defect that no medical treatment could stop, leaving him in constant pain. Their only solace came from the hope that the child would be spared further pain. The Shinigami told them there was no darkness on the soul, that there was no reason for him to suffer any more than he already had. The Uzumaki present broke down in tears. The child's parents, trying to calm themselves enough to speak coherently, thanked the Shinigami for telling them. This stunned him. Normally, humans begged him not to take a soul, offering promises and bribes. They didn't thank him for coming to take one. The parents continued, offering what help they could possibly provide him, should he ever need it. Anyone observing this would have gaped. Mortal beings, offering to help a seemingly omnipotent being like the Shinigami. The Shinigami had paused at that offer. While it was true that he did have virtually unlimited power, he was also bound by laws as well, preventing him from becoming directly involved in most mortal affairs outside of his normal duties. With human agents, he would have a loophole, should he ever need it. With that in mind, the Shinigami made the Uzumaki clan an offer. The infant had to die, but if the clan would serve as his agents among the living should he ever have need of them, he would be willing to give the clan some small amount of compensation. Negotiations began, awkwardly at first due to the emotional state of those present, but eventually an agreement was made. The Uzumaki would help the Shinigami when he needed them to, and they would gain the ability to summon water from the rivers and an ancient being. As soon as the deal was final, the infant's body finally gave out. In the decades following the deal, many changes were made. The Uzumaki were good people, but they were still human, and occasionally misused the abilities they had been given, like using phlegethin for heat in the winter. Why waste firewood if you know a jutsu that burns without fuel? Fearing that the Shinigami would be upset, the clan elders decided to restrict the ability to use the rivers. Seals were designed for each river, eliminating the need for the hand seals that had been used since they gained the ability. The seals were designed so that, in order to use a river, the user would have to either be in a life-threatening situation, or feel intense emotion. Positive or negative, it didn't matter, it was the strength of the emotion that counted. Also, the seals would become available in a specific order, to prevent someone who wasn't ready from using Lethe and Nemozine. The seals were then keyed to the basic standards of the shinobi ranks, Genin, Chunin, and Junin. Upon meeting the base requirements for each rank, two more rivers could be unlocked. Once the seals were finished, the use of the hand seals was forbidden. Looking over the requirements for each level, Naruto noticed that, by these standards, he had been capable of using the second pair for the last week. He just hadn't been in a situation where he needed to use them. It was also noted on the scroll that, in order to better hold up their end of the bargain, the clan decided that they would gain knowledge in various subjects. They had reasoned that having a broader base of knowledge in things beyond shinobi life would allow them to better do the shinigami's bidding, should their services ever be called upon. The clock caught Naruto's eye. 
Crap. I've been sitting here reading for an hour and a half. If I want Ichirakus, I need to leave now. Moving at a speed only available when running late, Naruto resealed the scroll, put it back in his room, and blasted out the door. Gotta move, gotta move, gotta oif. Naruto had collided with someone, knocking them both over. Picking himself up, he looked at who he had run into. Hanada-chan, and Naruto-kun. Hey there, what are doing here? Kurinai-sensei cut our training short today. I I stayed behind and trained by myself. I finished, and was heading home when I ran into you. I'm so sorry. Don't worry about it. Tell you what, why don't we eat at Ichiraku's? My treat. Naruto-kun, Hanada blushed lightly. R, are you asking me out on a D date? Now Naruto was blushing too, scratching the back of his head. I guess. I guess I am asking you out. What do you say? I I'd L love to. Great. Let's go. With that, Naruto took off, heading towards Ichiraku's. Hanada stood there, shocked. Naruto had asked her out of his own free will, and she had accepted. Afterwards, she was going to need to find a room where she could celebrate properly. She was embarrassed to admit it, even to herself, but like the members of Sasuke's fan club, she had a victory dance planned for just such an occasion, being asked out by the object of affection. Her status as the heiress, as well as her personality, prevented her from doing it where there was even the slightest chance of someone else seeing. She was deciding on possible locations when she heard Naruto's voice. Hey, Hanada-chan, are you coming or not? When the two arrived at Ichiraku's, Naruto hopped up onto a stool. Hanada calmly took one next to him. Ayame walked up to the counter, a big smile on her face. Naruto-kun, it's been three days. We were getting worried. And who is this? Ayame ne, this is Hanada-chan. Hanada-chan, this is Ayame. She and her dad own this place. I've been coming here for as long as I can remember. It's a p pleasure to meet you, Ayame-san. Likewise. Now, what can I get you to? After the ramen had been served, light conversation broke out. Tiuchi had come out from the back and was introduced to Hanada. Ayame took the chance to ask a question that had been on her mind for a while. So, Naruto, how's your training coming along? Must be something else, if it's keeping you from coming here. It's really cool. The only thing I'm really missing out on is what it's like being on a team. Tiuchi sighed. Naruto, she was asking what it's like being the Hokage's apprentice. No offense, but for a ninja, you aren't very good at picking up on what isn't being said. Naruto blinked. Hey, I'm working on it. Being the Hokage's apprentice is really tough. A lot of people keep telling me they're expecting great things from me, even if they're just sucking up to my sensei. Still, I'm not complaining. You aren't. That's a lot of pressure to deal with. Until a couple years ago, I could count on one hand the number of people in this village who honestly expected me to ever amount to anything. Yeah, I'll complain about being called an idiot, or any number of things, but I don't ever see myself complaining about someone expecting me to be better. That could change, Naruto. Everything can change. Now, what's this I've been hearing about you getting a Kenjutsu teacher? Huh. Oh. Yeah. Tomorrow. I start Kenjutsu lessons with Momochi Zabuza. We know about his reputation, and that he came back with you two after that C-ranked mission a while ago, but what's so special that has other shinobi talking about it? Some of them were fairly annoyed at the news. When I first started training with Sensei, a lot of shinobi started making offers to train me in different areas. For the most part, they just wanted to suck up to Sensei, and we turned down their offers. Some made the offer just because they really wanted to help. Made a guy was the only one whose offer we seriously considered accepting, because I needed a taijutsu teacher who could spar with me. If sensei ever sparred with me, he'd be bedridden for a week. We didn't want to take advantage of him, so we made an agreement. So the reason other shinobi are talking about it is probably because it's rare for me to ever get steady training from someone other than sensei or guy sensei. Okay. That makes sense, but I was under the impression Hokage-sama was an experienced weapons user. Why, then, is he having you study under someone else? He is a weapon user, but he specializes in fighting with a staff, mainly Enma, the ape lord, in his transformed state. He's good with swords too, 
but he told me that Zabuza would be teaching me. Hmm. I wonder why that is. I I'm not sure, but my guess is that it's part of s something about AP appearances. Naruto turned to look at Hinata. Why do you say that, Hinata-chan? Hinata took some calming breaths. She wanted to stutter as little as possible. Zabuza-san has a reputation for being dangerous. P part of his agreement to live here was that he would be able to teach Kenjutsu. The P problem is, if everyone is afraid of him, no one will ask for training. That's probably why you're going to learn from him. If H. Hokage-sama isn't willing to trust his student to be safe learning from Zabuza-san, W. Who will? That's very true. Tiuchi spoke up. A leader needs to be able to trust those he leads, but those that are led must also be able to trust their leader to make decisions that will benefit them all. Hokage-sama has taken a very big gamble in making Zabuza-san and Haku-san Konoha Shinobi. He needs to show that he was right in doing so. Haku-san, from what I've heard, has already proven he was worth it, simply by his performance as an academy instructor, not to mention his Kekai Genke. Zabuza, however, has not been given the chance. Quote dot dot dot, which is why I'm learning from him, Naruto finished to give him the chance to prove he's worth whatever may happen when Kiri finds out, or any of Zabaza's enemies. But we're still just guessing. We don't know for sure. Well now, my daughter and the Hokage's student, eating together. This is, unexpected. The new voice caused the four to look around for the source. Hayuga Hiyashi was standing next to one of Ichiraku's walls, an eyebrow raised. Hanada started tensing up. I was aware that the two of you were in the same class at the academy, and that you participated in a C-rank mission together. I wasn't, however, aware that the relationship between you was anything more than that of comrades. Naruto was sure that had this been any other parent, they would either be smirking, or would pull their child away. Hiyashi, or any Hayuga save Hanada, however, was pretty much unreadable. Naruto decided his best bet was to explain himself quickly, and mind his manners. He had seen pictures of what a Hayuga who was proficient with Juken could do to someone, and Hiyashi was certainly more than proficient. Hayuga-sama, let me explain. I was heading here to eat, when I ran into your daughter, who had just finished training by herself. I asked her to join me, and she agreed. If my offer disrupted any plans, I apologize. Your apology is unnecessary. I wasn't expecting to see my daughter until later. Hanada. You will be sparring against your sister tonight. Hanada gulped. Hi, Tu-san. Wait a second. You want her to spar against her sister? Yes, I do. Do you have a problem with that, Uzumaki-san? Well, if you want her to spar her sister, I know it's none of my business. I just don't see why. It is necessary. Hanada has never beaten her sister, Hanabi, nor her cousin, Neji, whom I am aware you occasionally spar against when you train with his sensei. Okay, but you still haven't explained why Hanada needs to spar with her own sister. Unless both are extremely cold-hearted, you're never going to see their full abilities. Hiyashi's eyebrow raised again, so you feel that Hanada holds herself back because she doesn't want to harm her sister. Why do you say that? I'll admit that my knowledge of how things work in a shinobi clan like yours, let alone a family, is pretty much non-existent. What I do understand is that while siblings will fight, most of it will be verbally, with a little roughhousing. Making them face each other accomplishes nothing except causing bad blood between them, and Hinata just doesn't seem like the type of person who would want to do that. Tell me, how sure of this are you? I'm very sure. Very well. Hinata will not spar her sister this time. Instead, she will spar you. Naruto blinked. Me? Yes, you. You were sure that Hanada is holding herself back when she spars someone she is related to. You are not related to her, so by your logic, she will not hold back against you. Or are you unsure of my daughter's ability to prove you right? Naruto winced when he realized how deep a hole he had dug for himself. Either he would spar Hanada, and risk hurting her physically, or decline, and hurt her emotionally by saying he didn't have faith in her. All right, I'll spar Hanada. Where and when? The dojo at the Hayuga compound, in an hour. Hanada knows the way. With that, Hiyashi took his leave. N Naruto-kun, why did you do that? You didn't have to accept. Hanada-chan, I'm sorry I got you into this mess. I opened my mouth without thinking, 
and I need to deal with the consequences. B but I couldn't hurt you. Hanada Chan, you're supposed to push yourself in a spar, physically and mentally. If you hold back, no one improves. Besides, as long as you don't try to deal a death blow, I'll be fine. I'll try. No Hanada Chan, don't try, do. An hour later, the two were facing each other in the Hyuga Dojo. Hiyashi and Hanabi were the only other people watching. Hiyashi spoke. Are you both ready? Getting nods from both, he began the match. Naruto was instantly on the defensive. Apparently, Hinata had taken his advice a little further than he had expected her to. From his infrequent spars with Neji, he knew that blocking would do little good against the Jukin, as even fleeting contact caused intense pain. He was better off dodging the strikes altogether. Of course, evading Hinata was no easy task. What she lacked in physical strength, she made up for in speed and agility. Naruto took any opening he could, short of openings at the chest or groin. He didn't want to risk accidentally groping Hinata, especially in front of her father, a man who could do all sorts of really nasty and painful things to him. Seeing his best chance to end the spar, he performed a leg sweep on her, sending her to the ground. Unfortunately, he didn't react in time to save himself from Hinata's own leg sweep. When he was down, she was on top of him, a knee on his chest and a palm strike aimed at his head, a sure death blow if she used even a little chakra. They were both still, until Hiyashi spoke. I believe I have seen enough. Hanada, Uzumaki-san, would you both please sit down? When both were seated, he continued. Uzumaki-san, I must concede that your argument appears to have some merit to it. I have never seen Hanada perform so well though it is too much of a jump in ability to be attributed solely to her not wanting to harm family. You said that making family members fight each other seemed cold-hearted. You are right, but I will explain why it is done this way, as it is a lesson you will need, should you achieve your stated goal, and make Hokage. Someday, one of my daughters will take over for me as clan head. Normally, as the oldest, Hinata would gain the position by default. At present, however, she has yet to meet what is expected of a potential clan head. Therefore, I must keep my options open, and consider Hanabi as a possible candidate as well. What is expected of the clan head? It can't be based entirely off the fighting ability. You're right. Though the clan head is expected to be exceptional with the Jukin, it is more important that the clan head has a strong will. Any leader, be it a clan head, a cage, or a daimyo, will have to make decisions that go against what they believe in, in order to serve the greater good. At this point in your life, could you do that? Hiyashi let them think about that momentarily, then continued. Another drawback to being a leader is that you will eventually make unpopular decisions, even if they are for the greater good. It is a fact of human nature that you can't please everyone. Yet, a leader must stand by his decisions. This is where Hanada falters the most. She wants to make everyone happy and cares too much about how others see her. Isn't it a good thing that she cares how people see her? In moderation, yes. After a certain point, however, you begin to care more about how you are perceived and less about performing the job properly. Leadership is not meant to be a popularity contest. This is why I have her spar her sister. If she is to lead the clan, she absolutely must have the ability to do what must be done, and live with the consequences. That does make sense, but isn't there another way? One that doesn't cause a rivalry between sisters. I wish there was a better way. Unfortunately, the only alternatives I can think of are even worse than this. Hypothetical situations are not as effective because they are just that, hypothetical. They aren't real, so much of the potential impact is lost. At this point, Hanada clutched her head and began making noises indicating she was in pain. Her father was at her side immediately. Naruto on her other side, with Hanabi staring at her, unsure of what was happening. Hanada, what's wrong? Speak to me. Hanada couldn't speak through the pain, and was beginning to tear up. Hiyashi activated his Byakugan to see what was happening, but he could find nothing out of the ordinary, other than an increased flow of chakra around her eyes. Eventually, the pain receded, and she could speak, albeit in short gasps. It it hurts sometimes, for me to use the Byakugan. Usually, the longer I ha have it activated, the worse the pain. Hiyashi quirked an eyebrow. That would suggest that you were running low on chakra. However, 
when I looked at you just now, you had not yet used up half of your reserves. This is most unusual. Hum. Hanada. Hanabi, the two of you may go. Hanada, I want you to go directly to bed. I would speak with Uzumaki-san in private before he leaves. The two left, and Hiyashi motioned for Naruto to come with him, out a different door. That was rather terrifying, but on to what I had intended to speak to you about. Do you understand now why I make them spar each other? Yeah, but I still don't like it. For that matter, neither do I. Like you, I also don't believe family should fight physically. This clan is almost irreparably divided by it. Now then, to continue the discussion we were having before the excitement, do you feel you are ready for the responsibilities of being Hokage? Sensei has been teaching me how to perform the duties of the office, but we haven't even begun talking about the mental part of the job. He said that it would wait until I was more experienced. More experienced? How so? He told me that even though I've been a shinobi for about four months now and I've been doing missions that are technically chunin level almost daily, I haven't killed anyone yet. That makes sense. As Hokage, you will be sending shinobi on missions, missions they may not return from. In order to properly understand the importance of it, this particular lesson in military leadership is often saved until after the potential leader has taken a life. The families of those that die may resent you for sending their loved ones. Do you feel you will be strong enough to withstand that? I've been despised by most of this village my entire life. I don't see how this will be any different. Oh, it will. I'm guessing that you are now aware of why you have been treated that way. The main difference is that what happened the day you were born was done to you and you were ignorant of what had been done until very recently, I would imagine. Yeah, Naruto nodded, I found out the day I graduated from the academy. Well, as Hokage, you would be making a conscious decision to send people on the mission. You will see the anger, the resentment, and you will know why it is there. The guilt will be what separates what you have endured from what you will endure. So you think I'll make it. That I'll become Hokage someday. Perhaps. You have stated that it is your goal. You are also being trained personally by the Hokage, moving you to the top of a very short list of potential successors. It would be foolish to ignore something like that. The two had arrived at the front door. Well then, thank you for the lessons, Hayuga sama You are very welcome. One more thing. Hiyashi leaned in close. If you ever make my daughter cry, and I find out, there is no place you can hide that I won't find you. Have a nice day. Naruto turned three shades of white and swallowed loudly. He then walked out the door. Hiyashi smirked. Ah, the joys of being the father of a teenage daughter. I've waited a long time to act the overprotective father. I enjoyed it. An. Like many other fans, I'm getting rather, shall we say, perturbed, at the way things have been going in canon for a while now. It pisses me off that, in order to stand a chance against the Sharingan, it seems that you either need a bloodline of your own, or an ability it can't copy. I swear, Kushimoto designed the Sharingan the same way little kids pick what superpowers they have when they're playing. I can fly, I'm bulletproof, and I have super strength, all at the same time. Of course, he also did something similar with the Rinnegan. Yet another chapter I'm not particularly impressed with. With regards to Hiyashi, I'm still not sure what he's really going to be like as a father. Naruto stumbled up to the door to his and Kakashi's apartment, completely exhausted. Today's training had been a nightmare. He had been made to run a gauntlet of tests by his teachers today, as a test of his overall progress. Taijutsu with Guy had been first, followed by Zabuza and Kenjutsu, followed by General Weaponry. Serutobi had covered everything else. He had passed each one but collapsed after he was done. When he came to, he was under a tree, the three men talking to each other. When they noticed Naruto had rejoined the world of the living, they told him that would be altering parts of his training regimen based on how he had done. Naruto was sent home, under orders not to train again until tomorrow. He unlocked the door. No one should be inside. Kakashi and Team 7 had been sent on an extended C rank a while back. They were escorting some bridge builder to Nami no Kuni and acting as bodyguards for him until his latest project was finished. Kakashi was reluctant to take it when it was offered, as he still felt Team 7 wasn't ready. Individually, they were ready, but their teamwork was still below what it should have been by this point. 
It was in the hopes that this would snap the two male genin out of their respective dysfunctions that Kakashi accepted it. Yo. Naruto blinked. Kakashi was lying down on a couch. Normally, this position was accompanied by a copy of Ika Ika, but the books were strangely absent today. Hey, you're home. Nope. I'm not really here. I'm just a figment of your imagination. Ha ha. When did you get back? A couple hours ago. We reported to the cage Bunshin Hokage-sama left in the office. It then dispelled itself to relay the information. I sent them home and came here. Kakashi's voice had a different tone to it. In place of the usual calm, almost apathetic tone, he sounded tired, not just physically, but emotionally. Naruto took a seat in a nearby chair. So how did the mission go? Well, our client wasn't exactly honest about the situation. On the way, we also ran into some missing nin from Kiri, the demon brothers. After that, I confronted him about what was really going on. Turns out, instead of a small gang of bandits terrorizing his work site, he was really being targeted for assassination by a wealthy businessman and his personal army. Wait, he lied about why he wanted ninja. Why did you keep going? It's true that if you discover that your client has falsified information vital to the mission, you have every right to quit then and there, and return to the village. The thing is, with a team, you need a majority decision to turn back. Sakura voted to go back, but Sai and Sasuke voted to continue. So what happened? We continued on to his home. It turns out he has a daughter and a grandson. I wish you could have come along. His grandson needed someone to talk some sense into him, and you would have done the best job at it. What's his problem? The man he considered his father was killed in public by the businessman, Gatto, for standing up to him. After that, he became a rather sullen little brat, thinking standing up to Gatto was useless. Now I wish Sensei had sent me with you. One question, though, if you knew how outnumbered you were, why didn't you send for backup? I should have, but at the time, I thought it would have done more harm than good to send for backup so soon. How do you figure that? We were the last of this year's genin teams to take AC rank, because I felt they weren't ready. I accepted it because they are ready for more advanced missions. It was their first C rank, and if I had sent for more help so soon, they might see it as a sign that I still didn't think they were ready. I know you were sent along with Team 8 for your first C rank, but if Kurenai had decided that you needed help for some reason, wouldn't you have resented it? Yeah, I suppose I would have seen it as a lack of faith in our abilities. Still, which is more important? Showing your students you have faith in them or doing what you know you should do to make sure they survive? I know, and that's one of my biggest problems. I'm an excellent shinobi in combat, but as a teacher, I suck. That's part of why I made sure that the graduating teams assigned to me always failed their test. Just because I'm called a genius shinobi doesn't mean I can teach others. I guess that makes sense. Anyway, what else happened on the mission? Thankfully, the demon brothers were the only shinobi we had to fight. The rest were just a bunch of bandits and mercenaries Gato had hired. We fought them, and I killed Gato, along with most of his goons. We stayed a couple extra days to recover, and headed home. Sasuke spent most of the trip home sulking. Why would he sulk? Did he not get to do anything? He was sulking because even though he had been in a battle, greatly outnumbered, he walked away from it without gaining the Sharingan. What? I thought it was supposed to activate in situations like that. It is, but there's a catch. From what I understand, the Uchiha in question must be in a life-threatening situation, and they must also be able to admit it to themselves. Sasuke was fighting for his life, but he refused to see a bunch of non-shinobi, no matter how many there were, as a threat to him. Had there been a shinobi for him to fight, he might have activated it. As it stands, he's probably going to go looking for a strong shinobi to fight, in hopes it will unlock then. He'd been watching Haku and Zabuza train before we left, so he might go looking for a fight with one of them. I'll warn them not to accept if he challenges them. Haku will try to avoid a fight, but Zabuza wouldn't hold back from putting the Tem in his place, which would be the hospital at best. Then you should definitely warn them. I just wish I could get through to Sasuke. I just want to do something to help him gain some peace of mind. I've been meaning to ask you about that. Why do you have such a personal interest in Sasuke? I know the council forced you to continue training the team, but why is he so important to you? I'm, 
Repaying a debt. A debt. Who do you owe so badly? I really don't feel like talking about it, all right. Kakashi. I really think you should talk about it. When I first moved in, you made me talk to you about things, so I could start trusting people with how I really felt. Why can't you share your story with me? Kakashi sighed. Curse him and his logic. He won't let it go until I tell him, either. I wonder which parent he got that from. Both of them could be damned stubborn when they wanted to. If you're so sure, I'll tell you. How much do you know about my own Genin team? All I've been able to figure out is that you're the last surviving member. When I was about five, my father was part of a team sent on an important mission for the village. The mission failed, because my father chose to save the lives of his teammates, rather than complete the mission. For his efforts, he became a virtual outcast. Not even those he saved would speak to him. Eventually, he committed seppuku. When this happened, I took it to mean that completing the mission was the only thing that mattered, that teamwork and friendship were useless concepts. The rules were the only things that mattered to me. Later on, I attended the academy, and at the age of seven, I graduated as the rookie of the year. My Junin sensei was the man who would eventually become the Yandaimi Hokage. My teammates were Akunoichi named Rinen. Uchiha Obito. Holy shit. Wait a second. If you were the rookie of the year, wouldn't that make him? Yeah, Obito was the dobi that year. He was one of a handful of Uchiha shinobi that weren't the rookie of the year when they went through the academy, and the only one to be the dobi. Bet that was a lot of fun for the other two on your team, having two icebergs on one team. Kakashi snorted. Actually, I acted more like a Uchiha than Obito did. Obito. Well, in all honesty, he was a lot like you. So Obito was only a Uchiha by blood, not mind. Yep. He was friendly, outgoing, and humble. He was also a total goofball. I see more of him in you than Sasuke. He also believed that teamwork was more important than anything. Well, that sucks. The one Uchiha I could have gotten along with, and I'll never meet him. I almost wish I could have seen the arguments between the two of you. The arguments were nothing special. I didn't really care about my teammates, so I ignored them at every opportunity, Kakashi hung his head. I didn't even bother with team training sessions most of the time. I would train by myself, and sensei would have to find me and physically drag me to them. So what happened? The war with Iwa happened. Obito, Rin, and I were sent on a mission. I was a Junin, and in charge of the mission. During it, Rin was captured. I was ready to abandon her but Obito wanted to go after her. He called me an arrogant ass, told me that those who abandoned their teammates were worse than trash, and took off to go rescue her. After a little bit, I went after him. We managed to rescue Rin, but were ambushed by Iwa Ninja. I lost my left eye, and Obito activated his Sharingan for the first time, only to be crushed by a rock slide. Before he died, he had Rin take his left Sharingan eye and implant it in my left eye socket. Kakashi was openly crying now, the first time Naruto had ever seen him do so. He died, and I never had the chance to tell him he was right, or how important he was to me. It makes me sick, thinking about all the times I insulted him and did things by myself. Even after all that, he still saw me as a friend. After that, I made it a personal mission to try and make amends by being the best shinobi I could be, and eventually pass on his beliefs to anyone I could. It's the reason I prefer the Bell Test, because in order to pass, you need to be willing to sacrifice your personal goals for the good of the team. I just wish I could have done something more to save him, or at least let him know he got through to me. He knew, Kakashi. Thanks for trying, but you're wrong. He never knew. Yes, he did. You said yourself that I'm a lot like Obito, so here's how I see it. The instant you turned back to go after him and Rin, he knew. If he hadn't gotten though to you, you would have left them both to die. He died anyway, so what good did it do? He died in vain. Naruto had never seen Kakashi this emotional. It was scary, to say the least. But if you hadn't gone with him, there's no guarantee he'd have even made it within sight of Rin, let alone save her. Instead, he died knowing that he saved her, and that he got through to you. He didn't die in vain, and he died relatively happy. What makes you think he died happy? Both you and Sensei have told me at some point that one of the greatest gifts any person can be given is the right to choose the circumstances of their death. 
he died on his terms, something a lot of people don't get the chance to do. I understand that you regret what you did and didn't do. That's normal. I also think it's great that you want to pass on what he believed. What I see you doing wrong, though, is that you're dwelling on the past, like Sensei does sometimes. You have both taught me that when a mistake is made, you're supposed to learn from it, and move on. You've both learned from your mistakes, but neither of you are moving on. Why can't you follow your own advice? You're right, and a lot of people have told us just that over the years. The thing is, Guild knows no logic but its own. It's why I'm trying so hard to get through to Sasuke, to repay my debt to Obito. No offense, but if you wanted to get through to him, you're a little too late. The best time to do it would have been right after Itachi killed everyone, when his Avenger routine wasn't set in stone. Now, I don't know what it would take to knock some sense into him before he does something really stupid. Yes, but I can still try. There's always a chance he'll come around. Naruto sat there and looked at Kakashi. It wasn't a glare or a stare, just an unflinching, penetrating gaze. It bugged the hell out of Kakashi, because the last time that look had been directed at him, it was coming from Minato Sensei. It was like his eyes were looking into his soul. Finally, Naruto spoke. You really shouldn't lie so much, Kakashi. Now you're lying to yourself and believing it. What's that supposed to mean? You say you're helping Sasuke to honor Obito's memory. That's not what you really want. You want Sasuke to become a second Obito, and that's not going to happen, not without a bunch of mood-altering medications or a lobotomy. You don't see Obito in Sasuke, you see yourself. You want him to come to his senses, but not in the same way you did. My point is, Sasuke is not Obito, and he probably never will be. I'm going to go take a shower. If you want to talk about this some more, we can do it later, all right. Kakashi nodded mutely as Naruto headed to get the stuff for his shower. When he heard the water start running, he stood up and made his way over to his bookcase. He reached up to the top, where he kept some personal trinkets. His hand hovered over a small metal box, covered in dust. He pulled it down, and opened it to reveal the team photo of his genin team. Back then, he had wanted to skip the photo and train, but Minato had thrown him over his shoulder and taken him to join the rest of his team. His eyes started tearing up as he looked at it, though only his revealed eye showed it. Is Naruto right, Obito? Am I trying to prevent Sasuke from making the same mistakes I made under the guise of repaying you? I know you regretted not having more time with us, but did you die happy? Minato Sensei, you would be proud of your son. He has the potential to take the title of the greatest shinobi ever to come from Konoha from you. He's also gained your ability to see what people are hiding, even from themselves, and can guess as to the real motivations of others. I still think that it's part of some hidden Kekai Genkei you had and didn't know about. Unfortunately, he's got his mother's sense of tact, and he's about as subtle as a wrecking ball. Still, I think he'll do just fine. Rin, what can I say? Before Obito died, I would blow you off, but in the end, you were really all I had left. After the war, Minato Sensei was busy with being prepared for the office of Hokage, but you were there whenever I needed you. I miss all of you terribly, and I'm going to do my best to make sure that no team ever has to go through what ours did, for as long as I live. Kakashi put the picture away, and sat back down. He then began to cry, harder than he had in a very long time. When Naruto came back out, he saw Kakashi drying his eyes. You okay, Kakashi? Yeah, I'll be fine. You just said some things that I needed to hear, but didn't want to. Oh, so, the rookie of the year, huh? Tell me, is that title really as important as people make it seem? It depends. In the academy, it's used as a motivator, to make the students work hard. Some see it as a goal to work towards, a sign of superior ability. To others, like you, the Abarame and Nara clans, and maybe Obito, it's something that hinders one's abilities as ninja. Two years ago, you said that you thought it was better for a ninja to be underestimated, to hide their true abilities. You have your opinions on how important it is, and they have theirs. Why do you ask? Well, I was doing some thinking in the shower, and I came up with three things that most rookies of the year seem to have in common. I'm not sure if they apply to everyone who got the title but everyone I could think of had them in common. Okay, 
Shoot. What are your three requirements for being rookie of the year? First, they have to be arrogant. Second, they have to be as friendly as an iceberg. Third, they need to have a self-destructive obsession with some idea or goal. I get the first two, but you'll have to explain that last one. Well, you said that you were obsessed with the rules when you were the rookie. With Sasuke, he's continually going on about, gaining power. Neji has this really bizarre attachment to fate, destiny, whatever. I see. Itachi was much like his brother, down to the, gaining power, thing. Orochimaru. Well he was always obsessing over learning new jutsu. It's really kind of frightening, now that you mention it. Although, someone could say that you have your own obsessions, ramen and becoming Hokage. How are those self-destructive? I love ramen, even though I've been told repeatedly that it's not good for me, and being Hokage is a lifelong goal, and I'm getting closer to it very day. Alright, what would you do if you couldn't be Hokage? Suppose you had to choose between having a family of your own and being Hokage. Or if you suffered some injury that left you unable to continue as a ninja. We don't know if Kayubi can regrow a lost limb. What would you do then? That stopped Naruto cold. I, I, I don't know. Which is why I asked. You have your heart set on being Hokage, which is an admirable goal, but you don't have any plans other than that. It's good to think towards the future, but you also need to keep yourself in the present. That means having a backup plan. I'll, I'll give it some thought. Good. I believe we've reached our depression quota for a while, so let's change the subject, shall we? What's been going on while we've been gone? Well, let's see. Haku and Ayame from Ichiraku started going steady last week. Isn't she three or four years older than him? Way to go Haku. Kakashi wiped away a fake tear. I'm so proud of him. Yeah, well, she's 18, and as a shinobi, Haku's a legal adult. Tiuchi thinks Haku's a great guy, and Zabuza was impressed when Ayame didn't seem to be afraid of him. Apparently, she said that Zabuza couldn't be all bad, if he was responsible for Haku being the nice guy he is. He asked her to keep it a secret, because it could ruin his bad reputation. Both Naruto and Kakashi got a chuckle out of that. Also, Hiyashi's asked me to train with Hinata every once in a while. He thinks I'm a good influence on her. Naruto ignored Kakashi's snorts and continued. They still don't know what's wrong with her by Akugan, so she's not allowed to use it except on missions or in a supervised spar with another Hyuga present. So Taijutsu training is out. You both have above average chakra control for your age and rank, so what's left? We normally just do some physical training. We've also been working on breaking out of an enemy's grip lately. Stuff like getting out from under them if we're pinned down. Due to Kakashi's mask, Naruto didn't see the evil smirk forming. He also didn't see Kakashi's question coming. So which do you like better? Her pinning you, are you pinning her? Naruto began flushing, stammering, wh what a are you ta talking about? Now he saw the smirk complete with I smile. Oh, you know what I mean. Do you like it better when she's on top, or when you are? Naruto gaped, trying to come up with an answer that didn't make him sound like a pervert. Kakashi's gaze wandered over to the box with his team photo in it. Minato sensei, it should be you, not me, teasing your son about this. But since you can't be here to do it, I'm more than glad to. It was three in the afternoon, and Naruto was sitting on a park bench, watching the people pass by. There was a council meeting today, and Serutobi was required to be there, so his training had ended early. He didn't want to go home just yet, and everyone else would be still training with their team. Kakashi was still teasing him mercilessly about him, wrestling, with Hanada. Naruto could tolerate the teasing to an extent, but Kakashi's suggestions for what, moves, or, holds, he should pull next were a bit too much. His sitting and watching the crowd was rapidly turning into a new hobby for him. He had started doing it as a training exercise. At first, he had been less than thrilled than his new exercise involved a lot of sitting, but after Serutobi had explained the purpose, he regained a little interest. It was supposed to build up his observational skills. Serutobi had demonstrated by selecting a random couple, who had been looking into the window of a formal clothing store, and began making several guesses into aspects of their personalities and lives. 
He also estimated that the two had been together for over three years, and had recently become engaged. Naruto asked how he had come up with that. Sarutobi replied that they were holding on to each other, which suggested a relationship. The length of the relationship came from how they were holding each other. Newer couples would tend to cling tightly to one another. The two were close together, but held each other loosely. When Naruto asked about the engagement, Sarutobi replied that neither of them was wearing a wedding ring, so they were most likely not married. They were also looking at the window display, which was showcasing garments for weddings. Since then, Naruto often found himself observing people around him as a way to kill free time. He was so caught up in it that he almost didn't hear the person approaching him. Ah, Naruto-kun, would it be all right if I joined you? Go right ahead, Haku. How's the academy? It's a wonderful experience. Yumino-san is amazingly easygoing, though he says it has something to do with you not disrupting his classes anymore. Naruto laughed. Good ol' Aruka-sensei. I should really pay him a visit one of these days. Things have been way too easy for him, now that I'm not there to spice up his duller lectures. I still have yet to figure out how he managed to get me back afterwards, though. So, how have you been adjusting to life in Konoha? I know how Zabuza is doing, but I haven't had a chance to talk to you in a while. I'm grateful to be here. Everyone, shinobi and civilians alike, have just been remarkably welcoming. Although, I now understand why you feel the way you do about abusing a Kekai Genke. Hokage-sama told me that after the current academy semester is complete, I will be eligible for missions, if I choose. Somehow, word got out, and ever since, some of the villagers have come up to me saying that with my Kekai Genke, missions are going to be easy, as if my abilities with ice are the only reason I'm a competent ninja. Well, we both know that isn't true. I've seen you training. Now that you and Zabuza aren't on the run, you've gotten to the point where you could probably take the Junin exam and pass without once using it. As for the villagers, that's what they are used to saying to someone with a Kekai Genke. The clans have always taken a large amount of pride in their unique abilities, and I don't have a problem with that. Ignoring something that can give you an advantage is just stupid. Where I draw the line is when they focus so much on that unique ability that they end up ignoring everything else. You just haven't shown the villagers that you don't share the same viewpoint as the clans do. But besides that, what do you think of Konoha? It is a wonderful place. Zabuza-sama had told me that Konoha shinobi were considered odd by the standards of other villages. I just assumed he meant their continual above-average abilities. It wasn't until we came to live here that I learned what he meant. In every other shinobi village I have ever heard of, shinobi are cold, emotionless tools, regardless of whether they are on a mission or not. Here, that is only partly true. On assignment, we are professionals, as we should be, but off-duty, most act just like any other villager. We are shinobi, but we are also human. I find that attitude most appealing. It is nice being allowed, if not encouraged, to have a life outside of our work. I am curious, however, about the Yamanaka clan and their flower shop. I don't quite understand why they would have two jobs, especially ones so different. Naruto laughed. Yeah, I thought the same thing when I first met Ino at the academy. She beat me to a pulp when I asked her if she was only going to be a part-time ninja. Sensei told me the story behind it. Back when Konoha was first founded, there was a lot of construction work going on. Gardens of any sort were hard to find. The fields used by the original settlers were turned into building sites and some of the older training grounds. The catch was, gardens were needed to grow the plants we use for poisons and medicines, not to mention food. It was eventually decided that a greenhouse would be built, and it would grow those plants until personal gardens larger than a window box were an option. At the time, the Yamanaka clan didn't have many duties vital to the village, so they were put in charge of the greenhouse. Once things calmed down, and personal gardens started appearing, they decided to make a little money, and opened a shop that sold flowers and gardening supplies, in addition to still growing large amounts of the shinobi plants. But why would people grow their own poisonous and medicinal plants when there is still the communal greenhouse? Because with the exception of the hospital, there are limits on how many plants can be taken for use by any one person. You can only take so many plants per month. The hospital can take as much as it wants, whenever it wants. 
So, with that kind of background, would that mean that your classmate Eno is knowledgeable with poisons? You know, I'm not really sure. She never showed any signs of skill with them, but that stuff wasn't really covered in depth in the academy when I was there. I am sure, however, that she would at least know which kinds of plants are poisonous and which aren't. Haku nodded. I see. I have a question for you. This is coming from both myself and Ayame-chan. Okay. Shoot. Would you and Hinata-san be interested in going on a double date with us sometime? Naruto blinked. I wasn't expecting that one. What brought this on? Ayame-chan feels that the two of you make, and I quote, such a cute couple. I haven't seen how the two of you get along, but I am willing to take her word on it. I, I'll ask Hinata-chan the next time I see her, but I'm not promising anything. That is all we ask. So what hobbies have you and Zabuza taken up in your free time? Haku chuckled. Both of us are still trying to find ones that suit us. I had actually thought about trying to make decorative ice sculptures at first. Obviously, making the ice wasn't a problem for me, but as it turns out, I am a terrible sculptor, and I don't have enough time to learn how to do it properly. Eventually, I lost my temper, and turned what I had created into ice cubes. That act was actually very therapeutic. You enjoy destroying what you made. Well, whatever works for you, I guess. What about Zabuza? Zabuza Sama is having a much tougher time with acclimating to our new way of life, let alone finding himself a hobby. So far, the best he's managed to do is play darts at a bar when he's off duty. I'm of the opinion that the only reason he can even do that much right now is that he's equating playing darts with projectile weapons training. I'm sure you'll both find something. Naruto heard something, and looked up. A messenger bird was flying overhead. It dropped a letter into Naruto's lap turned around, and flew back the way it came. Huh, looks like Sensei wants to talk to me about something before his meeting. Talk to you later, Haku. Good day, Naruto-kun. You wanted to see me, Sensei. Yes, yes I did. The council meeting was rescheduled for tomorrow afternoon. I called you back to talk to you about the upcoming Chunin exams and your place in them. Naruto's face lit up. You're nominating me. Thanks, Sensei. You're the greatest. Serutobi sighed. Naruto-kun, you've gotten ahead of yourself. I cannot enter you because there aren't two free genin to take the test with you, and I couldn't bend the rules enough for you to take it solo without having to deal with the backlash from the other villages. The smile dimmed. Then, what did you want to talk to me about the Chunin exams for? Just to tell me I can't take them. If I can't take the exams, then I can't get promoted. You're only partially correct. You can't take them, but the Chunin exams aren't the only way to get promoted. There are alternatives. Then why doesn't anyone talk about them? If you ask Genin, the only promotion method they know about are the exams. The reason is simple. We want Genin to take the exams and try for promotion that way at least once before we let them find out about the alternate routes. It's good for the village. Huh. The Chunin exams showcase the best each participating village has to offer in front of potential clients. The alternate routes do not attract new clients to the village. That is one reason. There is also the money brought into the village by both those taking the exams and the people who come to see the exams. They pay for food, lodging, admission to the exams, and possibly do some shopping while they are here. That influx of money is why the location of the Chunin exams is fought over each time it is held. So, are you putting me on one of the alternate paths, then? Yes, I am. You will be assigned an acting Chunin mission that closely relates to the upcoming exams. It will begin before the exams start, and will end after they do. Like the exams, your mission will have three parts to it. Successfully complete two of those three parts, and you will be given full Chunin status. Naruto's interest rose. Can you tell me what the three parts are now, or do I need to wait until later? Serutobi pulled out a map of the elemental countries, while Naruto pulled out a notebook. I see no reason why I can't. Some of the foreign participants will be meeting at an outpost at the borders of Haino Kuni, Serutobi pointed to a specific outpost, and Naruto noted it. The first portion of your mission will be to go there and escort the foreign shinobi to Konoha. Successful completion will be all foreign shinobi arriving safely, though exceptions can be made for extenuating circumstances. 
That's a lot to ask of one person, Sensei. You misunderstand. I fully expect that the teens will be able to defend themselves in an attack. If they aren't, they shouldn't be taking the exams. Your responsibility is to guide them to Konoha. Should they choose to fight amongst themselves, that is not your problem. Each sensei is responsible for their team's behavior. Anyway, the second portion will be you helping myself, Aruka, and a handful of others oversee and administrate the exams. You won't have a role in proctoring any of the three parts. You will be working behind the scenes to make sure everything is running as smoothly as possible. Success here is simply how you perform at what tasks are assigned to you. The third and final part is rather straightforward. You will serve as an alternate for the third portion of the exams. If there are an uneven number of contestants, or if someone fails to appear, you will take that place. I thought it would be good for you to see how you stand in comparison to the others. Now then, do you believe you can handle this, Naruto-kun? Naruto looked over his notes for what he would have to do. Well, it's a lot for one person, but I think I can handle it. I do have one question, though. By all means, ask. How could you arrange a mission like this for me? I know that you are in charge of this kind of stuff, but how can you put all of this together without anyone making a fuss? By following standard procedure, Serutobi replied, pulling a piece of paper from a desk drawer. To request an acting rank mission, this form must be filled out. It requires the signatures of two shinobi of Junin rank, along with mine. If a request is approved and the mission is a failure, there is a mandatory waiting period of a year before you can request another. I have your form filled out for you. All you have to do is sign this, and the mission is yours. That doesn't sound so hard. Finding the two Junin sponsors is easy. The hard part is getting my permission. Each month, a good 15 to 20 percent of my paperwork is made up of these requests. Out of all of them, less than half get approved. So who sponsored me? Let's see. Hayuga Hiyashi and Abarame Shibi. Isn't that Shino's dad? Why would he sponsor me? Serutobi smiled. Ah, that's right. You wouldn't remember. Huh. Remember what? When you were a baby, things were very chaotic. I had tried keeping you in my sight at all times, but I couldn't do it. Even then, you were a handful. Then, the Abarame clan stepped in. They would watch you during the day, and you would stay with me and my family at night. This continued until you were 16 months old, I believe. At that point, I put you in the orphanage system. Why would they volunteer to look after me? The Abarame have always seen you as something of a distant relative. Like you, they are not always warmly welcomed, and the villagers tend to confuse them with their tenants as well. The main difference is that there are many of them, and only one of you. Yeah but their tenants didn't nearly destroy the village and kill everyone. True, but that isn't to say it hasn't happened on a smaller scale. What? For the Abarame, emotional control is a must. Their colonies respond to the host's commands. If a host feels emotion, the Kikai respond to that as well. Should an Abarame give in to anger, their colonies will lash out and attack the cause of that anger. It doesn't even have to be anger, any emotion will suffice. I remember about 20 or 30 years ago, some village children decided to see if an Abarame was ticklish. They succeeded, and spent the next two weeks recovering from what had happened. Their target began laughing, lost control, and his Kikai attacked, nearly killing them. So they were willing to look after me because we had a lot in common. Yes. Around your first birthday, Shibi came to me asking for permission to adopt you. It killed me to say no, but... The Yandaimi's orders, I know. Shibi was most displeased. He asked why I was acting contrary to my normal stance, which was to seek as much protection for you as I could. I tried to convince him I knew what I was doing, but he didn't let up. So, I took a calculated risk, and showed him the Yandaimi's letter of instructions. To this day, he is the only other person besides me and Yandaimi to see the letter in its entirety. After that, he was more understanding of my position and promised to support me in matters regarding you to the best of his ability. Wouldn't he have seen the part about who Yandaimi wanted to take care of me? No, an Abarame would have been among the last to see that. Why, as a shinobi and a role model, there were few better suited for the office of Hokage than the Yandaimi. However, his skills as a writer, 
speaker and administrator were average at best, and that is being nice. He knew what he wanted to say, but often couldn't find the right words. He had a very strong tendency to put his foot in his mouth at the worst possible time, though that trait disappeared as he got older. If it weren't for his sensei, Jiraiya, writing his speeches, and myself, working with him on his administrative skills, he would have destroyed the village on his own well before the Kayubi. Why does that mean Shino's dad wouldn't see it? If one were to read the letter, not knowing Yandaimi personally, it sounds as if Kakashi, Jiraiya, and I were the only people in all of Konoha he trusted. That was how I interpreted it for ten years, though something always seemed off about that statement. It wasn't until I read it again, two years ago, knowing how he thought that I saw what he had meant to write, that the three of us were the only ones in Konoha he trusted to take care of you. Shibi didn't know Yandaimi very well. Besides, the traditional Abarame mindset makes them poorly suited for mental profiling. So he sponsored me for this because his clan sees me as family. No offense, but that doesn't sound like an Abarame. The logical reason is missing. He also said it was his way of saying, thank you. Apparently, you said something to Shino on that joint C rank. Yeah, we were talking about how to broaden our skill sets. He commented that the constant chakra drain meant he couldn't use most nin or genjutsu. I pointed out that there were other things he could work on. He said he'd think about it. Gave him the family diatribe, eh? Well, he did think about it. Shibi said that Shino is now poised to become the most powerful Abarame of his generation, if not in recent history. He's been working with techniques that the Abarame have not used in generations, and not just some of their more powerful clan techniques. Some of them, I haven't seen since I was your age. Well, I'll have to thank Shino's dad anyway. Here you go, sensei. Naruto signed the form and handed it back to Serutobi, who was smiling. You know, I'm still not used to you calling me sensei. Well, yeah, ten years of, Oji-san, compared to about six months of, sensei. Have a good day, Naruto-kun. You too, sensei. After Naruto left, Serutobi turned around to look at the vault with the other half of Naruto's inheritance inside. Every day, he was tempted to just give the scroll to Naruto and be done with it. He wasn't sure what kept him from doing so, other than his respect for the Yandaimi's wishes. After a couple minutes, he stood, put his hat on, and walked out the door. He had been set free early today, and he'd be damned if he was going to stick around and risk them finding something for him to do. He was going home. Naruto was in the middle of unpacking what he would need for the night, surrounded by the members of the group he was escorting doing the same. As he did so, he let his mind wander. The week before Naruto had left had been unusual for him. With the village getting prepared for the exams, Naruto had found himself with more free time than he could handle. The entire week, he hadn't trained with Serutobi, Guy, or Zabuza. Serutobi was dealing with organizing the whole ordeal. Guy had stepped up his team's training, so he was probably thinking of nominating them for the exam. Zabuza had simply told Naruto that he was going to be too busy to work with him for a while. One day, he had wandered over to the academy around lunchtime. There, he ran into Aruka and Haku. When they found out he had nothing to do, they asked him to stick around and help with the class. He also learned just why Zabuza was planning on being so busy. He and Haku had both been tapped to help proctor the exams. Haku had been permitted to do his hunter nin routine during the first part, eliminating obvious cheaters. Zabuza would be working on the second and third parts. He was currently touring the forest of death with the other proctors for the second part, getting acquainted with it. Haku said he had never seen Zabuza so, giddy. Serutobi had told Naruto what the three parts entailed, then told him not to talk about it with anyone who wouldn't already know. Basically, he wasn't supposed to tell any of his fellow genin. The three kept talking for the rest of the lunch break. When the students returned, some of them recognized Naruto as being the Hokage's apprentice, and were suitably awed. The class went outside for some practical work. Once outside, the students swarmed Naruto, asking him to show them a jutsu. With Uruka's permission, Naruto performed some of the most basic jutsu he had learned, beyond the ones from the academy. The highlight of his performance came when a Sweden jutsu went awry, soaking Uruka. 
The students received an impromptu lesson in not judging how good someone was based only on who their teacher was. Naruto ran from the sopping wet Uruka, and even though he had been training with some of the best shinobi in the village, Uruka still managed to catch up with Naruto, hogtie him, and drag him back to the training area, where Uruka posed with his captive, looking very much like a hunter displaying his kill. Amusement was had at Naruto's expense. He and Hinata had gone on the double date, and Naruto couldn't deny that it was one of the best decisions he had ever made. The four of them had gone on a picnic. At the time, Naruto had still been a little dazed by the smile Hinata gave him when he clumsily asked her about it. Having a Yame and Haku there was a good thing, not only because it was their idea, but because it kept the atmosphere light and fun. It had been strange for Naruto to see how well Haku and Ayame got along, as parts of it resembled how he and Hinata interacted. Maybe he really did care for Hinata as more than a friend. Naruto shook his head vigorously. Now is not the time for this. I'm on a mission. So far, his escort mission had been rather nerve-wracking. It was his first solo mission outside the village, and he was determined not to screw it up. When he had arrived at the outpost, some of the Junin sensei had expressed annoyance at his presence. They were annoyed that only one escort had been sent, and that said escort was a rookie genin, younger than most, if not all, of those he would be escorting. That changed slightly when a Junin had asked to see the papers identifying Naruto as their escort. He read through them, and couldn't contain his shock when he saw. He, like the others, had seen Naruto's role as their escort as a veiled insult to them, that they weren't worth Konoha sending a more experienced guide. When the Junin read the part listing the Sandame Hokage as being Naruto's sensei, however, he couldn't keep it to himself. As a result, everyone was staring at Naruto, gauging him. Once they were satisfied that they hadn't been slighted after all, they started heading for Konoha. Naruto's group was of small to moderate size. The teams came from Kusa and Suna, with Suna in the majority. Teams from other countries would be escorted by other Konoha shinobi. One Suna team, however, kept attracting his attention, and he wasn't sure why. From what he could figure out, the three genin were siblings. All three of them were carrying different objects on their backs, and for the life of him, Naruto couldn't figure out what they were. All he knew was that whatever the older boy was carrying, it had moving parts, if the clacking noises were anything to go by. That said, Naruto couldn't help but laugh internally at the older shinobi's choice of wardrobe. The face paint was bad enough, but a black jumpsuit. Naruto had made his fair share of dumb decisions, but wearing a full-body black jumpsuit in the desert wasn't going to be one of them if he could help it. Of course, the cat ears the hood created didn't really help make the get-up any more intimidating, either. How could he possibly do anything without passing out from the heat? The oldest member, Akunoichi, whose name had been revealed as Tamari, was unnerving to Naruto. Tamari was very self-confident, and it showed. There was just something about her that made it nearly impossible for Naruto to not look at her. Maybe it was the fact that she had a personality similar to his, or maybe it was because like him, she was a blue-eyed blonde. The last genin simply creeped the hell out of Naruto. When Naruto had first arrived at the outpost, the redhead's eyes widened, and he began clutching his head, muttering under his breath. Ever since, the genin had been eyeing him with a look that was almost, hungry. The trio's sensei walked up to him. Uzumaki-san, the other junin and I have put together tonight's watch schedule. Is there anything we should know about? Um, yeah, I'll be having some cage bunch and doing some chakra control exercises for a while. Tree walking about 20, maybe 30 feet away from the center of camp, so I don't disturb anyone. One problem Naruto would always have in his shinobi career was his chakra control. Serutobi had hypothesized that due to the Kyubi's presence in Naruto, his chakra coils were extremely malleable. Any exercise that would build his chakra reserves would end up having double or even triple the intended effect. Even if he never used chakra in a training session, his coils still increased in size daily. As a result, his control would plummet if he went too long without control exercises. So, when his group stopped for the night, he sent his clones off to perform control exercises with whatever they could find. The first time he had done so, the others had asked him about it. He passed it off as a medical condition, 
one he had since birth, which was true enough. Nothing life-threatening, it just shot his chakra control to hell if he neglected it. They seemed to accept it, and had asked only that he let them know when he was going to send his clones out. Apparently, the fact that he knew Cage Bunshin had been written off as a result of his being a Cage's student. While normally Naruto would have corrected them, this time, he let them think that. Deception was a ninja's greatest tool, and what better deception than letting others jump to conclusions? The Junin, Baki, nodded and turned to go inform the others, when a thought struck him. Uzumaki-san, has my student Gara? has he done anything to you? Gara, oh, the one with the gourd. Nah, he hasn't done much that I've noticed, outside of watching me like a hawk and making a lot of comments about wanting my blood. Trust me, if he had done anything to you, you would know it. I would advise you to tread carefully around him. He's not exactly stable. I'll keep that in mind, though I don't understand why you are giving me the warning. It's simple. Without you, none of us can enter the village for the exams. Therefore, it is in the best interest to all of us that you arrive at the village alive and well. Fair enough. So when is my shift for guard duty? 10. Till 2. It was around midnight, and Naruto was in the middle of his guard shift, hidden in the trees. Off in the distance, he heard the sounds of his clones performing control exercises. When he heard rustling near him, he tensed. Who's there? Uzumaki-san. Gara appeared on a nearby branch, his eyes burning into Naruto. Gara-san, what is it? My mother. My mother calls for your blood. San shot out of the gourd on Gara's back, headed directly for Naruto. Only a quick Kawarimi saved Naruto from collision with the sand, which arced suddenly, changing direction towards Naruto's new location. So that's what he's been carrying. That much sand's got away a ton, but he hauls it around like it isn't even there. And how the hell is he making it attack me? I haven't seen him make a single hand seal. Naruto's musing cost him. The sand had almost caught him when he snapped out of it and used Kawarimi again, the sand narrowly missing him. The sand impacted with the tree he had been on, uprooting it and sending it to the ground. The resulting noise woke the rest of the camp, if the shouting was any indication. Naruto began trying to lead Gara further away from the camp. Baki was the first to arrive on the scene, Tamari and Kankuro on his heels. What the hell is going on here? Gara. Oh shit. Kankuro called out. Oi, Blondie. What did you do to make Gara attack? Hell if I know. I was just. Crap. Kawari me. I was on guard duty, and he comes out of nowhere, saying his, mother, wants my blood and attacks me. I don't even know your mother. An annoyed grunt came out of Temari's mouth, as the others began making their way to see what was creating such a commotion. For Kami's sake fight back. It's your only hope, although you still won't stand a chance against Gara. I'm under orders not to attack any of you, for any reason. Uh oh. Wah. Gara's sand had caught up to Naruto, hitting him square in the chest and sending him backwards. He was sent bodily through several trees that were behind him. He landed on the ground, more sand coming at him. Sabaku Q, Gara hissed. Sand was now covering the majority of Naruto's body, and spreading quickly. Now you will die. Gara, Stop. You kill him, and none of us will be able to take the Chunin exams. Not to mention what could happen when the Hokage finds out his student was killed by someone he was escorting. Silence. None of you can stop me. I will have his blood. Naruto was now solidly encased from the waist down. His upper body still had some range of movement, but was losing it as time passed. Crap. I can't move my arms or fingers enough for a jutsu. I've only got one chance. Here's hoping I really am strong enough to use this, because this definitely qualifies as a life-threatening situation. Hey. Psycho. Let me go, or you'll regret it. Gara growled at being called. Psycho. You will die. I had hoped for more of a challenge from the student of one of the strongest shinobi alive. It's a pity. Uzumaki Haijutsu. Yomi no Oakawa. Akaron. Twin torrents of water surged from Naruto's hands. As they headed for their target, Naruto watched the jutsu in action. Physically, the water showed no signs of being any different from normal water, but Naruto couldn't really see it in the dark. What was different was the sound it made. As the water raced through the air, 
its wake sounded like people wailing and crying. It was enough to send shivers down the spine of everyone present, though Fergara shivered for a different reason. Then the jutsu hit him. The world faded to black around Gara. He could neither see nor hear anything around him. Then, he found himself back in Suna. In front of him was himself as a little child, crying as his uncle, Yashimaru, began trying to kill him. Despite Gara's current attitude, he did not want to watch this. It brought up things he had repressed successfully for years. Unfortunately, he could not turn away. If he turned, he found himself still facing the scene, which continued uninterrupted in front of him. After that scene ended, another began. This time, showing Kankuro and Tamari trying to talk to him, followed by him scaring them away. The next showed them trying to get him to come play with them, only to meet with the same result. Several similar scenes played, each showing more time had passed in between. The images continued, and it was quickly becoming too much for Gara. Had he faced the images one by one, he wouldn't have cared at all. But starting with Yashimaru and showing Gara the highlights of his life without end was overpowering him, and he began tearing up. Then the scenery changed drastically. He was no longer anywhere he knew, but if he had to guess, he was in Konoha, judging by the greenery. From the decorations, there was a festival going on. Then he saw what looked like a younger version of their guide run past, followed by what appeared to be a mob composed mainly of intoxicated villagers. The boy was unable to escape, and when the mob was broken up by Anbu and a man who must have been the Hokage, he was in very bad shape. Gara shifted uncomfortably. The villagers of Suna had occasionally tried the same thing with him, only to be stopped by the sand. This boy however, had no such defense. Now the scenes featured younger versions of their guide, Uzumaki. He would try to participate in normal activities, such as playing in a park, only to be chased away or left out. One thing that struck Gara was how the villagers referred to Naruto as, demon, which was how Suna's populace referred to him. Could it be that he, is he like me? With that, the dam burst, and Gara began to cry for the first time since his uncle died. When Naruto's jutsu had connected, Gara's sand had gone haywire, destroying everything it could. The sand encasing Naruto had dispersed, joining the rest of it in causing mass destruction, and leaving Naruto on the ground, gasping for breath. Baki, Tamari, and Kankuro were all right, experience with Gara giving them the ability to dodge safely. In the background, they heard the other Junin telling their teams to stay within the camp. Suddenly, the sand stopped causing damage, instead just whipping about wildly, as if it was caught in the wind. Then, they heard crying. When they looked for the source, they found to their great surprise, Gara, crying like someone half his age. They looked at each other, unsure of what had happened to him or what to do. Kankuro gaped. He's crying, actually crying. What the hell's going on here? What kind of jutsu could have brought Gara to tears? Baki was stunned. If this boy, Naruto, could affect someone the likes of Gara, You, you might want to go over to him. He really needs you right now. The three Suna Nin turned. Naruto had drug himself over to rest against a tree that was still in one piece, more or less. Baki turned back to his two students. Go see to Gara. I'll tend to our escort. Walking over, Baki quickly gave Naruto a once-over. Well, you're pretty beat up. On the other hand, you're still alive and in one piece, which is nothing short of amazing. I do believe that you are the first person to fight Gara and live to tell. Should I be honored? I suppose you should. As I said, you are the first person to survive a fight against him. Even the case cage is wary of dealing with him. That said, what the hell did you do to him? Imagine the worst moments in your life being played back to back without end. Memories you never wanted to see the light of day ever again. That is what I did to him. He's a Suna Shinobi. Such a jutsu shouldn't affect him. Baki-san, that may be true, but he is still human. Has someone you deeply cared for ever died in front of you? Not just comrades, I'm talking family too. Of course that has happened to me. I was with my father and grandfather when they died of combat injuries. My grandmother died about four months later, and I was there for that as well. I was about eight. Well, you would have seen them dying in front of you once more, and yourself back then. 
The jutsu shows you every moment in your life that would cause you to feel sorrow and regret. Contact with the water alone weakens your mental defenses, making you more vulnerable to the memories. Well, if you put it that way, I don't think I would be able to stand it, either. Part of the shinobi lifestyle leads to having a lot of unpleasant memories. On their own, each one could be dealt with, but seeing your life play out in front of you like that can't be good. Hearing muffled cries, the two turned to look at the siblings. Gara had Tamari and Kankiro in a bone-crushing hug and was crying, while repeating what sounded like, I'm sorry. Both elder siblings were alternating between fearing for their lives and the instinct to comfort their brother. Kid, let's leave them be. I'll take you back to camp, and then I'll finish up your watch shift. The next morning was rather awkward. The group broke camp around noon, to allow Naruto to recover and so the older two of Baki's students could get some sleep. Apparently, they had both spent the night up with Gara. Naruto wasn't sure what Baki had told everyone about what had happened, but the other Sunanin seemed to know what had really occurred. As Naruto walked along, his thoughts drifted back to last night. Something odd had happened when he struck Gara with the river. He had seen the same things Gara had, and Naruto wasn't sure that should have happened. In everything he had read about the Acheron, no mention was ever made about the user and the target sharing memories. Was it something that they just didn't talk about, or did it have to do with him? Man, what I wouldn't give to talk to someone who knew, really knew, how these rivers work. Uzumaki-san, came a voice from behind him. Turning, he saw Gara. What can I do for you three? Naruto was on guard. I, wish to speak to you about what happened last night. All right, what do you want to talk about? Under the effects of your jutsu, I, saw some things. Is there any truth to what I saw? I could say no, but I'd be lying. I also saw parts of your life, and I know we have quite a bit in common. Perhaps we do, even more than you think. I, too, carry a demon within me, the Aikibi no Shukaku. Naruto's eyes widened. Well, I'll be, you're right, we do have more in common than I thought, only mines. Kayubi no Kitsune, if your village's history is anything to go by. Gara finished. Yeah, I was born the day of the attack. Yandaimi sealed it into me and lost his life in the process. But your Yandaimi is supposed to have killed the Kayubi. If the least of the Biju, the Shukaku, couldn't be defeated, only sealed away, how could the Kayubi? I take it that the Kayubi is your, medical condition, then? Yeah, Sensei passed a law forbidding most everyone from speaking the truth, on penalty of death. The only people who can speak about it are myself the active Hokage, and anyone I allow. Kayubi's death is reality for everyone who wasn't there during the attack or was too young to know what really went on. Tell me, how does your village see you? Do they regard you as a hero for what happened? Hardly. To most of the village, I'm little more than a nuisance that has to be tolerated. Even to the people whose opinions really matter to me, I'm still not a hero. They see me for who I am, Uzumaki Naruto a 12-year-old genin who wants to be Hokage. I'm no hero, and I don't really want to be seen as one, not unless I've done something deserving of it. What I carry was never a secret. Everyone in Suna knows and fears me for it. Why was Shukaku sealed into you? Was it attacking Suna? No. Before it was sealed into me, Shukaku had spent several decades sealed in a teapot. For a while now, Suna has been losing funding and missions to other villages. As a result, our forces are about the same size as most minor villages, but our quality is consistent with a major village. Suna needed a weapon, an invincible shinobi. On the case cage's order, Shukaku was sealed into me before I was born. It is strange. Both you and I were created out of desperation, though situations were different. I never expected to find another like myself. I thought I was alone in this world. I can see where you would feel like that. Still, you had a brother and sister who wanted you around. Why did you push them away? The first person you saw try to kill me last night was my uncle. He took care of me for the first six years of my life before that night. After that, I was convinced that Tamari and Kankiro would do the same if I let them get too close. The group continued towards Konoha, Gara and Naruto discussing their lives. Back in Konoha, 
Sarutobi was in his office, taking a break to eat lunch, when his receptionist knocked on the door. Hokage-sama, Hayuga Hiyashi wishes to speak with you. Send him in. Hiyashi walked in, bowing to Sarutobi. Sandame-sama, Hiyashi-san, please, sit down. I hope you don't mind if I eat my lunch while we talk. If I don't eat now, I won't get another chance until this evening. It is no bother, Hokage-sama. Thank you for seeing me on such short notice. As you said, it is no bother. Now, what can I do for you? It has to do with your student. I have some concerns involving him I wish to speak with you about. Sarutobi set down his lunch. So much for a light, informal chat. Hiyashi, you of all people should be able to recognize. Hokage-sama, I am well aware that the boy is not his tenant. Had I ever felt otherwise, I would have taken measures to keep him away from my daughter. Then what is your problem with him? I do not have a problem with Uzumaki-san. My concern is with the Yondaimi's seal. Please, continue. The Yondaimi was amazing with seals, I am not arguing with that. However, he was in a hurry when he designed that seal, and in even more of one when it was applied to Naruto-kun. He knew what he was doing, but he was still human, and capable of making a mistake, especially under pressure. Sarutobi replied gruffly, the Yondaimi's seal has held for almost 13 years now. The Kyubi is not going to escape. Why do you bring this up now? Just because something has not happened yet does not mean it will never happen. We both know that as seals age, they become unstable unless maintained. To my knowledge, Naruto's seal has never been looked at in any great depth by a seal master. For a seal as important as Naruto Kun's that is unacceptable. Serutobi sighed. I see your point. What you say is true, and you backed your argument logically. I don't know why I never thought of it myself. Perhaps it is because you are too close to the boy. The village at large sees the prisoner instead of the prison. You are at the other extreme, seeing the boy and choosing to ignore the tenant's presence. An argument I have heard more than once. Where do you place yourself, then, Hiyashi? I like to think of myself as being somewhere in between. I see the boy, but also recognize the danger he contains within. Very well. I will send for Jiraiya. It is my understanding that Yondaimi gave him some special scrolls specifically for maintenance on that seal. Do you find that satisfactory? Yes, Hokage-sama. Thank you for listening. Yes, well, thank you for coming to see me in private, instead of bringing the issue up in a council meeting. Kami only knows what could have happened. You're welcome. Could you tell me how young Uzumaki-san's training coming along? Why the sudden interest in my apprentice? My daughter believes him to be worth her time. I merely wish to understand him better, so that I might come to an informed opinion of my own on whether or not he would be good for my daughter. Serutobi arched an eyebrow. And the real reason? You wound me, Hokage-sama. That was my real reason though I will admit to being curious about the shinobi who is currently the front-runner for being named your successor. To be honest, I'm not sure what he is truly capable of. As far as I know, he is the first person to ever be trained to lead a ninja village before taking office. Everyone else has learned through trial and error. Will he be a capable leader, should he make it? He knows how to handle the daily routine, but he has yet to experience the truly difficult duties of this job firsthand, Serutobi paused, then smirked. I have a sneaking suspicion that one of his first acts as Hokage will be to delegate some, if not all, of the more mundane duties to others. I doubt he would be able to stand being in here all day, every day. With all due respect, you two are alike in that respect. Why didn't you delegate your duties to others yourself? I wanted to avoid creating too much of a bureaucracy. The last time I delegated any authority for an extended period of time was when I allowed the council to set the academy standards, and we wound up undoing those changes. Yes, I recall doing tree climbing when I was in the academy. Hanada knew it when she graduated, but only because I taught it to her. Naruto-kun's shinobi training is moving rapidly, especially for having only half as much time to train as his classmates. He is turning out to be a very well-rounded ninja which is a source of both joy and annoyance for anyone teaching him. Annoyance. How so? Normally, when a shinobi reaches Chunin, they have already begun work in their field of specialty. Naruto is so balanced in most things, he has no idea what to specialize in. 
The only things we've managed to eliminate are Genjutsu and medicine. Fuinjutsu is a weak point, but since the only things he's been taught to make are storage scrolls and exploding tags, that's understandable. I take it, then, that the normal methods are not working. You mean training him in completely opposing things to see which suits him better? No, that is failing miserably. He isn't a genius by any definition, but he shows so much raw potential in everything he does, we can't bring ourselves to say that he'll never be truly good at it. Quote dot dot dot, causing you and his other instructors both joy and frustration. What's that old saying? Jack of all trades, master of none. That's only half of it. The other half is, though often better than a master of one. The funny thing is, that is apparently the Uzumaki clan creed. That doesn't surprise me. He is very much like his mother in that respect, among other traits. Sarutobi cursed himself for letting that slip. Now, now Hokage-sama, don't blame yourself. I was at that assessment of yours, and I saw what young Naruto did. That was a clan technique unique to Kashina and her clan, so he must be related to her. I also remember that she was pregnant when she died. Sarutobi tensed, dreading what Hiyashi could say next. I believe I will take my leave. Good day, Hokage-sama. Something in Hiyashi's eyes said that he suspected something, but Serutobi decided not to push the issue. Good day to you as well, Hiyashi. Have you reached a decision regarding my student? Only that he warrants further investigation. As Hiyashi left, Serutobi began writing a letter to Jiraiya. Uzumaki Haijutsu. Yomi no Oakawa. Akron, Uzumaki Secret Technique. River of Hell. Akron. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.